about your time, but uh, good evening um, on my time. Um, this, this is a subject that uh, was not suggested by me, um, as David has already said, but by brethren in, in Turkey and in uh, South America. And it caused me to go and dig out a paper that I'd started working on um, something like nine years ago, but never finished. Um, so, uh, so in some ways, you've actually done, uh, done me a service because um, I now pick up uh, incomplete research and I now realise from what I'd already done that this is actually an enormous subject, um, probably not something that we're going to be able to complete tonight, but certainly we can, we can scratch the surface. Um, and in many ways, um, what's been interesting to me um, in sort of picking up this, this subject from so long ago is the connections that I see in that um, original research um, with what we've been talking about over these past few weeks, uh, particularly um, Hermeticism, um, William Shaw, of course, uh, and James VI um, of Scotland, James I of, of, of Britain, um, and we'll see these connections. So what I'm going to do, because, um, because this is old research, for once, I'm probably, I'm not going to rely totally on my memory and just talk. I've got some notes here. So if you hear rustling paper and uh, puzzled looks um, on, on my face, um, just please bear with me because it's me trying to find a little bit of information. Um, the, the research paper is far longer than I remember it, um, even although it is incomplete. Um, it's about 14 pages, so it might take me a little bit of thumbing through to find what it is I want. So um, it perhaps might not be as smooth um, a, a delivery as I would like, but as I say, please bear with me on this. Um, so what we're talking about tonight is Sir Robert Murray and the Royal Society. Now, as I say, because the subject is so large, we may have a problem covering both of those aspects. Um, I think by the time I've finished with Sir Robert Murray, there'll be very little time to actually discuss the, the, the Royal Society side of things. But we'll, we'll go ahead and um, we'll, I'm sure we'll work something out, even if we have to come back to the subject um, in the future. Um, so like uh, um, the, uh, what I've been saying over the last few weeks, uh, we're blessed, um, as I said repeatedly, we're blessed in Scotland with so many written records um, that frankly, uh, it's a bit of an embarrassment to someone like me because um, you would think that, you know, the further back in time you go, the less written material there is. And that to a certain extent is true, except, except in this occasion, where we do have a lot of information and it's extremely interesting. And that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. The written information um, about Sir Robert Morey, and then we'll go on and, as I say, talk about the Royal Society. So we know that Sir Robert Morey um, was born um, in either 1608 or 1609. The actual year's not terribly clear. And he, he died in 1673. Now, um, he, we have, as I say, so many different um, bits of information that sometimes a bit difficult um, to know where, where to start. But we're going to start right at the most important and interesting part for us um, with a little bit of history about Sir Robert Murray, his, his background, um, and why he's of great interest to us as, as Freemasons. Um, we know that once um, James um, VI had gone to London and uh, become King of Britain, um, he took with him his uh, son, Charles I. And when Charles um, became king on the death of his uh, father, um, there, there was a lot of religious turmoil in the country. And because um, Charles um, believed that he was now the king of a united, he was now the king of a united kingdom, Scotland and England. Um, sadly, Wales doesn't get a mention, but um, a, a unified country under one monarch. Um, he was of the religious opinion that uh, the, the whole country under him as king should be worshipping in the same manner, whether you lived in Scotland or England. 
The problem with that, of course, is Scotland had a long and turbulent history of going its own way in matters of religion. And we had a, um, a, a Protestant Reformation in 1559, um, which established um, a, a kind of unique form of Protestantism, um, Presbyterianism. Um, and Charles, in his wisdom, decided that he wanted um, to have an Episcopalian form of Protestantism, which was much more similar to what uh, the religious practices of England were. So he was trying to impose Episcopalianism um, on the Scottish uh, people. Um, the great problem with that was that Episcopalianism requires the rule of uh, bishops. So uh, con local congregations are not um, self-governing, which in many ways is very similar to the early Scottish lodges, which were also self-governing. There was no um, higher authority. Um, so you had churches, local Presbyterian Protestant churches running their own, own affairs. And I now begin to wonder whether there was some connection with the way religion was organized in Scotland, whether that had, had any impact on the way the early Scottish Masonic lodges were being run because this, the similarity between the two is quite striking. Anyway, for whatever reason, Charles um, wanted to have this kind of one nation uh, religious um, uh, model. Um, and so he imposed this uh, on, or tried to impose this on the Scots, which led directly to a war, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, the Scots didn't like being told what to do by this guy in England. Um, and so there was a couple of wars, um, the, the react, the, and the reaction of the Scots was to sign what they called the National League and Covenant, Covenant in 1638, which preserved the Protestant faith in Scotland. Um, and because uh, Charles was trying to impose his view of religious practice, um, he wanted a prayer book, for instance, a, a unified prayer book to be used. Anyway, to cut long story short, um, there was uh, two wars, the first bishops war, um, in, uh, in 1638, which was actually bloodless. Then the Second Bishops' War in 1639, uh, which did in fact mean that the Scots invaded England. Um, and so you can see that some things never changed. Um, so the Scots invaded England um, and that all that uh, turmoil, um, that conflict um, led directly into the English Civil War. And uh, although it's the English Civil War, uh, as it's described between cavaliers and roundheads, um, between the king and parliament, uh, the Scots were very much involved as well. Um, the result of these two bishop wars, which were before the, 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 the civil war in England, the result was that the Scots were um, allowed to occupy Northern England. And um, they had uh, as their uh, military base, their mil military headquarters were, <clears throat> We're in Newcastle on Tyne, which is in the, the, the far north of England, northeast of England, not far, not that far from the Scottish border. So um, it, this is where the Scottish army is encamped. The war is over, so it's relatively peaceful, but it's still an occupation, uh, an army of occupation for that part of England. And it's in this part, it's in this um, place, Newcastle on Tyne, that one of the most significant events takes place which is the initiation of Sir Robert Morey um, into the Lodge of Edinburgh, Mary's Chapel number one. Now, uh, it wasn't the, the complete lodge, it wasn't the entire lodge. Uh, this, this, this lodge was uh, compiled of people, uh, members of the lodge from Edinburgh, who were with the army, the Scottish army in Newcastle on Tyne, um, where they were part of the Pioneer Corps. They were the engineers, um, they helped the, the Scottish army um, to move artillery, built bridges where necessary, all the kind of things. I mean, in America, America I suppose a similar thing would be the CBs uh, in the UK. That would be the Royal Engineers. In those days, it was this, uh, just, they were just Scots um, who had the ability to build things. And so some of the members of the Lodge in Edinburgh were with the army and they decided to convene a lodge meeting in Newcastle and Tyne uh, in May 1641. And at, at that meeting, they initiated um, 
uh, uh, Sir Robert Mori, as I say, but also, and perhaps uh, more significantly in some ways, um, another non-stonemason by the name of Alexander Hamilton. And Alexander Hamilton was the general uh, of artillery. He was responsible for the Scottish cannons, um, the Scottish Army um, Artillery Corps, if you like. So you have the two, two very, very important uh, high-ranking military men um, involved with this lodge. So Robert Morey was the quartermaster general of the Scottish Army, and Alexander Hamilton, as I say, was the, the general of artillery. So these two are initiated on the same day um, together. So they clearly they knew each other from their military uh, activities. And now here they were being made Freemasons in this lodge. And of course, the Scots do tend to like to say that this is the first recorded initiation um, of a speculative Freemason uh, on English soil. And indeed, that is correct. Uh, Sir Robert Morey was um, uh, uh, one of the intelligentsia. Um, he's obviously a member of the aristocracy, minor aristocracy, admittedly. He's a, he's a knight, he's a sir. Um, and Sir Alexander Hamilton is also uh, a member of the aristocracy. So they are clearly um, not stonemasons, even although they're joining a stonemasons lodge. So they are, by today's uh, description, they are speculative masons. And as I say, this is in 1641, um, which is a long time um, before Elias Ashmole um, is admitted to a lodge, according to his diaries anyway, uh, admitted to a lodge in Warrington in Cheshire. But even then, um, Sir Robert Murray and Alexander Hamilton, Sir Alexander Hamilton, are not the first speculative masons to join a Scottish lodge. That happened even earlier in 1634. So in some ways, Sir Robert Murray and Alexander Hamilton are simply following in the footsteps of other um, members of the, of the Scottish aristocracy by becoming interested in what this operative lodge um, are actually doing. Now, we're, we're never going to know for sure why they joined, but joined they did. And we know this because what happened was when the Scottish army was disbanded and uh, the Scots went home, these members of this lodge went back to the lodge, um, the building um, in Edinburgh, and they explained what they'd done. And the secretary of the lodge recorded those facts in the lodge minute book. So they record, admittedly, a little bit later, not too many months later, but the lodge actually, actually recorded um, these two people being initiated into Freemasonry in what you would not call a, a proper lodge because it was only some members of the lodge that had this meeting. However, this, this practice was quite common, so we've got to be careful not to, not to uh, read too much into it. Um, where um, members of the lodge had gone either for work or in this, well, in this case it would be work, but work of a military nature, it was quite common for members of the lodge to initiate people um, who were local to where they were, um, initiate them into the lodge and then report back to the lodge and who would then record it in their minute books. And these are known as out entries, which is out of the lodge area. Um, and as I say, it's fairly common, they crop up quite frequently um, in these early minutes. So they were doing nothing unusual. What is unusual, of course, is the two individuals that they decide um, to initiate. Now, normally, um, um, there's been some criticism of, well, if these are so-called speculative masons, they were only, they only wanted to join just to see um, what was going on. And that might well be true, but in the case of Sir Robert Murray and Alexander uh, um, uh, Hamilton, um, there was more to it than that because they appear in the lodge uh, later as well. Um, again, they're re they're, they record their presence in the lodge by signing the minute book. So we know that th this wasn't just a flash in the pan. It wasn't just a one-off, something to do to kill time while they're on military service. Um, they come back to the lodge um, after being initiated. And of course, um, the year I think is quite interesting, 1641, because um, as a past master of Lodge Sir Robert Morey, 
1641, you can see what the Scots have done uh, today, modern Freemasons today, um, they've waited until the number 1641 um, has come up um, in, in the register of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, and then they've formed a lodge named after this, um, this very eminent individual. And not only that, but they've got the number of the lodge as the year of, uh, in which he was initiated. So Lodge Sir Robert Morey, 1641, is in, is in memory of this very important individual. Yet sadly, nothing um, has been done to commemorate or memorize or me memorialize um, Sir Alexander Hamilton, the General of the Artillery, who obviously was also quite important. But unlike Maury, there's not very much written about him. We don't know much about his life. We know a lot more about Sir Robert Maury. So that, that was the circumstances surrounding Sir Robert Morey's initiation um, in, into um, the Lodge of Edinburgh. Um, we know after that, he takes a great deal of interest um, in, in things that we would loosely describe as esoteric. As an individual, he was extremely interested in all sorts of different subjects, uh, from uh, alchemy to fishing, to coal mines, to all sorts of symbolism, all sorts of different things um, he was interested in. That ultimately would lead, I think, to the formation of um, the first genuine scientific body, which was the Royal Society, of which um, more later. So although we have this written record in the lodge about Sir Robert Murray and him being initiated in, in, um, in this uh, lodge um, by elements of the members of that lodge in Newcastle, uh, we also have a, 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 an amazing amount of material um, written um, by him. And that comes from a very simple um, fact that um, his, his good friend, um, uh, the Earl of Kincardine, um, was, whose um, descendant was a, still a, um, is, was a past master, sorry, a past grandmaster of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, Lord Elgin, um, the Earl of Kincardine uh, was quite a senior member of the aristocracy. Um, he goes away to Germany, and we think he went to Germany to try and find ways of improving um, his coal mining uh, enterprise, which um, he had on land in Fife, um, uh, without getting too complicated about it. Um, the, coal, the coal mines he owned were quite substantially under the sea, which made uh, getting the coal out um, a very grim um, affair. So we think he was probably in Germany looking for engineering experts to make a more efficient extraction of coal possible. Anyway, to cut a long story short, um, he gets to Germany and he goes to Bremen, where he's struck down by a fever. And this is a, a, a recurring fever it re reappears every four days, um, and he's virtually bedridden. He can't do anything. He ends up being stuck in a in a an inn or a tavern, uh, the Swan Tavern in in, in um, Bremen, and he's he's there in a foreign country with nobody around him. Now, at the same time, his good friend Sir Robert Morey is in Maastricht, which is now in the south of Holland. And he was in uh, Maastricht, almost certainly, um, to conduct spying operations uh, on behalf of all sorts of different governments. He seems to have been employed by Richelieu of France, Cardinal Richelieu of France. He was also spying for the Scottish government, but also um, was sending reports back to the English uh, King, Charles I. So, he was a very, um, very industrious and enterprising individual. It's very difficult to explain why he was a spy for all these different enemies, um, uh, except that he was probably just a very good uh, juggler of, <laughs> of things, and he was able to keep all these, uh, all these balls in the air at the same time. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he's in Maastricht, and we, I can give you the, the exact dates, um, when I find the notes, but he's in Maastricht um, for some time. He actually describes the fact that he is um, he's in Maastricht. Um, he's nailed 
to Maastricht, which implies he's under um, orders to stay there. He can't leave. He's he's literally nailed to that town. Um, and what is interesting is that he's clearly um, interested in things locally, because uh, and he's known. He's obviously known um, to the locals as being some kind of expert. They approach him for advice on how to build a new town hall. And what he does is he, he uses his um, expertise. I don't think he's a qualified architect by any manner of means, but he uses his um, expertise to design um, a new town hall um, for the, the city of Maastricht. Interestingly enough, he doesn't attach this uh, new building to any of the existing structures. This is a completely new standalone building in the center of a, of a very large city square, and it still stands to this day. You will, uh, if you go there, um, it's actually a very interesting building, and I need, it reminds me, I need to do some research um, to see, if possible, whether any kind of Masonic influence is brought to bear by Sir Robert Murray on the design and the location. That's uh, perhaps for, for the future. But because of his skill in designing and building the structure, he's made a, a member of the Stonemasons Guild of Maastricht. So he's not only a, a, a member of an operative lodge in Scotland, here he is joining a Dutch um, Stonemasons Guild. Um, and that was an important step as well as any sort of, I mean, this, he was being rewarded for um, his, uh, his contribution to the new town hall, which still exists, by the way. Um, so he, he's, been, he's been rewarded um, for, by the locals for um, the design and building of the new town hall. But it's also an, an important step to becoming a Brabant citizen, which is a citizen of the, of the area. And so he's, he's obviously extremely well thought of by the people um, of that area at the time. Anyway, that's why he's that's why he's in Maastricht. Okay. Now, what happens is he 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 learns that his friend, whose whose name's Alexander Bruce, second Earl of Kin or later second Earl of Kincardine, Alexander Bruce is lying in bed in this in this tavern in Bremen, and he's he's seriously ill. So, and Murray can't go to his bedside. He's stuck. He's stuck in Maastricht. So what he does is he starts to write letters to Alexander Bruce and he tries to treat Alexander Bruce's um, illness in writing. And there's over a hundred letters um, written to Alexander Bruce by Sir Robert Moy, um, covering all sorts of different subjects. And it's clear that um, Maury um, has this uh, belief in the power of words. And this is something we may have touched on over um, the last few weeks. Um, words, uh, and this is quite Kabbalistic in, in nature um, and hermetic, that if you, if you can um, put powerful words together in a certain sequence, their power is magnified. So um, Mori is trying to use this technique to treat somebody's illness at a distance of some hundreds of miles. Um, fortunately for us, his letters still exist. They're in um, uh, Lord Bruce's family library um, in Fife, an invaluable resource um, to, in, into all sorts um, of different insights into this individual's mind. So Robert Murray um, uses his um, intellect to write these letters um, um, to treat uh, Bruce, and he, re he recognizes that he's dealing some with someone who's got a physical illness, but also has a, a mental illness um, brought on by confinement and uh, isolation. Um, that sounds kind of similar, doesn't it, to today? Um, and in some ways, we are replicating Sir Robert Morris technique, except we're using um, 21st century technology to do it. But this is exactly what Sir Robert Murray was trying to do for his friend. He's trying to um, encourage him to, to be a, a, in a better uh, state of mind uh, mentally, 
and also giving him advice on his physical condition. So firstly, on, on his physical condition, um, he, he writes recipes for um, certain potions and medicines that um, um, uh, Bruce, Alexander Bruce can have um, made up um, locally in Bremen in the hope that that potion or medicine is going to help his condition. So that's the, that's the kind of physical side of things that Sir Robert Morey was trying to, to do. But he was also, as I say, in, uh, very keen to try and lift um, his friend's uh, spirits. And he does this in a variety of different ways. Uh, sometime he, sometimes he browbeats um, Bruce for, um, uh, he implies that he, he's being, um, uh, he's being, um, he's playing on his illness. He's not, you know, he, he's not really as ill as he says he is. Um, so he browbeats him for that. Um, but at the same time, he tries to, he will then um, uplift him with different stories um, on different things that he's interested in, as I mentioned, things like fishing or whatever. Um, so he does this whole gambit of what you would probably call um, today the liberal arts and sciences. But more than that, um, he talks to um, Alexander Bruce in his letters about what Freemasonry means to him. Now he selected um, a Mason's Mark when he was initiated into the Lodge of Edinburgh. This was uh, a common practice and still is in Scotland to this day, where once you have been initiated, uh, initiated, passed and raised, um, more often than not, uh, you will take a mark, uh, you take the mark degree um, in a Scottish Lodge. And in the process, you will select a mark that is unique to you as a Freemason. Um, the, that's that's the long and the short of it. So everybody, every Freemason, every Scottish Freemason that takes his mark degree has his mark. So I'm going to show you Sir Robert Morey's mark now because it's important. And I'm sorry that I didn't have a, a time to create a full PowerPoint presentation for you, um, but at least you'll get to see. Um, and David can release the screen sharing function so that I can share this image with you. So David needs to unfreeze the screen sharing. Okay. Try now, try now. It should be okay, okay. now. There we go. So this is Sir Robert Morey's mark. And every time he was, you can see it okay, can you? Everybody see it all right? Just uh, expand to the full screen if it's possible or make it smaller so we can see full uh, full shape uh, in a picture. Maybe if, if you zoom out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Is that zoom better? Out a little bit. Yeah. No, it what? didn't change. It, no. It's showing that it's 182%. Yeah, uh, I don't know how to do that. I'm not down, not that. down in the bottom right corner. You can shift that slider a little bit to the left. All right, got you, got you. Good. Every day is a school day. Is that better? Can you see that? Let me just. Not, not yet. No. Yeah. Actually, Do you I don't see, see where it says 182%? Yeah, I'm trying to reduce it so to... Now, I think what we'll do is we'll, re we'll resort to the image rather than the PowerPoint. So can you see that? It's not moving, it's just stuck there. All right, I think we're just going to have to... Um, Yeah, yeah. I just put it in the middle of the screen. Is that? Can you see that? Should be fine. I think uh, we see everything, so uh, the rest is fine. 
All right, is that better? You see that? Oh. Anyway, the main thing is that you, you get you get to see it. Sorry, my technical ability is not terribly great, as you can tell. Um, but then I suppose that's what Masonic historians are like. They're pretty useless. Anyway, to cut a long story short, this is uh, Sir Robert Morris' mark. It's actually, um, it should be um, the, this, the middle point that's pointing to the, to the top left should actually be pointing directly up. For some reason, the image itself is, is round, slightly round the wrong way. Um, so I'll just leave it with you. Anyway, so Sir Robert Morey, this is his mark. He chooses it um, for all sorts of reasons personal to him. And these are explained um, in his letters to uh, Alexander Bruce. From this point, from, this, from the time of his initiation um, to the time that he's writing these letters um, to uh, Alexander Bruce, um, he always signs his name um, and with the, this, this image um, as part of the letter Y in his name. So it forms the tail. So these letters, they're written in 1657 to 1659. So you can see that his friend is stuck in Hamburg for the best part of two years, um, which is why there's well over 100 letters um, sent by Maury. Um, and he's, 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 he talks, not, as I say, not only about medicine and all these things that interest him, um, but he talks a lot about Freemasonry. What he, his main point, um, and of course, he's quite conscious that Bruce is not a Freemason. Bruce, as far as we know, never joins a lodge, never joins a Scottish lodge at all. Um, but um, um, Maury is quite happy to explain to his friend um, what, uh, these, what this symbol means to him in particular. He talks a little bit about Freemasonry, but he gives, gives nothing away in terms of the initiation ceremony that he and uh, uh, Alexander Ham uh, Hamilton experienced. So he's, he's clearly conscious that there are some things he can talk about and some things he cannot. And he talks about his personal, um, his personal experience and what things mean to him, but he doesn't give away anything that the Lodge did during the course of the, the ceremonies. So um, this, this uh, um, pentacle, uh, or he calls it a star, um, and I think that's deliberate. I mean, it is a pentacle or pentagram, but he calls it a star, S-T-A-R-R, -R, because a star uh, has a particular significance to him. Now, we know that when it comes to symbols, uh, quite often the circle is used to uh, indicate um, immortality, um, something that never ends, you know, the infinite. Well, the star to Sir Robert Morey uh, is exactly the same. And if you look very carefully at the image, you will see that as, a, as in a circle, the lines never end. And he's been very clever the way he's drawn this. You can see that the, the lines go over and under each other. So like the circle, there is no start point and no end point to any of these lines. Now, uh, and he explains that. He explains this is, this is the reason. So this is a very complicated way of talking about uh, immortality. And we do know that um, uh, Maury was a very educated man. He was a Presbyterian, but he was also a Stoic. He was uh, very learned and he understood the Greek language. Um, and he was a follower of Epictetus, who was probably one of the most famous Greek Stoic uh, philosophers. So here we have um, a Presbyterian Stoic um, giving his explanation of a symbol that he's using to demonstrate um, immortality or infinity. But he goes further and you can see that he's added some letters and these are Greek, these are in Greek. Now, I'm not a Greek language specialist, but
do Bob Scott, Scott uh, do you hear me? I hear you. So I, believe, I guess it's uh, on the Robert side. I believe that Robert's uh, screen has frozen. Yes, yes. Okay, let me let me tell him. Okay, I thought something went wrong with me. Just a second. His connection, maybe. Oh, okay. He's back. He's back. Robert, are you back? Are you with us? I'll I'll uh, stop the screen sharing. Yeah, you're on the other device, I guess. Hmm. Stop participant sharing. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can you speak and the uh, screen should change? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, the other device is on, right? Yeah. So if you can see me and hear me, we're we're back. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. We can use that way and then uh, switch off uh, later when you don't need the screen. You just switch off the device and it should go off. Right. You 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 don't need. You, do you want the image back? Oh, okay. So all fine now. All fine now. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah. The internet in uh, my internet connection um, was cut. Um, I don't know why. I think I think there's a lot of people staying at home just now. So <laughs> so the internet's getting overloaded. Um, anyway. So um, right. So we get. I don't know quite where you lost the connection, but I was talking about this is Sir Robert Morris star, and he has drawn it in such a way. The, the lines of, that make up the star are never ending, right? So this, for him, this, um, this represents infinity or immortality. Um, so again, it's a very personal interpretation. As I say, most people would simply uh, use a circle, um, but he's gone to this um, really extravagant length to uh, depict infinity um, in his own way. Now, um, we we're talking about um, what he does with these Greek letters. Um, translated, um, they, they simply um, mean love and brotherly love at that. And so we have a, a relationship between a fairly elderly man, Maury, and a younger man, Bruce, which is a platonic and intellectual relationship. There is absolutely no sexual connotation at all. Um, in this friendship, that would have been ab abhorrent to both in individuals. Um, but anyway, that's that's my opinion. Um, so what this what he's done is he has used this Im image of infinity um, to represent the infinity of brotherly love, as he understands it from his initiation uh, into this lodge. So brotherly love is infinite. It's not just restricted to uh, Sir Robert Morey and his friend Bruce, but it is a brother, uh, Masonic brotherly love is infinite and never ending. So this is that's that's the connotation um, of this of this symbol. And as I say, for over two years, he talks about this um, regularly um, with with his friend Bruce. So once uh, Bruce is um, better and goes home. Um, Robert Morey is also very quickly, uh, soon after, uh, is very quickly allowed um, to leave Maastricht and he goes back, um, back home. Um, he goes back to London uh, where he's given accommodation uh, in the King's Palace. Uh, that again is, you know, this is uh, Charles uh, that we're still talking about. Um, when uh, we, you know, a little bit later than this, we have this, of course, there's a lot going on in England. I don't want to give you a long history lesson about England and Scotland, but essentially the, the Roundheads win the Civil War and uh, a, a form of parliamentary democracy is established with Oliver Cromwell as the Lord High Protector. Um, Cromwell dies in um, 
1658, which is why almost certainly um, both Bruce and Maury are able to come home and they, they get back. Um, and because of Cromwell's death in 1658, the monarchy is restored. And uh, of course, Charles by this time is dead, but it's Charles II, his son, that is now on the throne. And Maury is given accommodation by that, uh, by that king um, in the Palace of Westminster, where he takes over a laboratory um, that was owned um, by a fellow Scot, um, I, I, whose name I'll, I'll be able to tell you <laughs> in, in a minute. Um, but he takes over, yes, it, he's, uh, yeah, he's given a, a, a guy called David Ramsey, who was using um, the same accommodation um, as a laboratory. Um, he was a clockmaker to Charles I. Anyway, so, uh, and we know that Maury settles in um, to this uh, Palace of Westminster. He's working in his laboratory, which we know from his writings are equipped with um, furnaces. Um, he only describes one, um, one particular experiment um, in detail, um, and that was um, to try and make uh, something, uh, some kind of medicine that's going to help the plague, which, as we all know, descends on London, the Great Plague of London in 1665. The people, um, people decide it's time to leave, or those that could leave, decide to leave London to escape the plague. Um, and Maury uh, manages to find accommodation um, in the home of Samuel K uh, Kem, a Church of England cl uh, clergyman in uh, Albury. Uh, it's interesting that, and this is where we begin to make connections here, um, he goes to uh, this, this uh, Church of England uh, manse um, in Albury, where he takes up the same accommodation as um, William Outrud, Outrud, I don't know how you pronounce that, my apologies, um, and uh, he was an alchemist um, in residence with that Church of England um, uh, minister. So what he then describes is what he does in, like so many people, they're isolated, they're, um, they're, they're away from friends and family, they don't have access to all their own equipment. And uh, so Robert Morey starts to pass the time by doing some chemical experiments, as he calls it. And he describes it very specifically where he's trying to extract lead from a certain ore that's been mined in Wales and he's trying to extract the lead um, from this uh, rock uh, take, you know, brought from Wales and turn it um, into silver. And so that's what his uh, chemical experiments are. But he does admit uh, at the outset of, the outset of his experiments that he doesn't expect to make much success of, out of it. Um, but oddly enough, he actually does succeed in, in, in making silver, not a huge amount, but he is able to make silver from this ore. So whether he's actually converting lead into silver, I doubt, but he's found a way of extracting the silver um, from this ore. And this is, interestingly enough, this is reported to the Royal Society at a later date. But before we leave um, his, uh, his alchemical experiments, it's important um, to know that Thomas Vaughan, and those of you who are interested in this, this uh, area, um, Thomas Vaughan, you know, an extremely well-known hermetic philosopher and alchemist um, who had been working with Maury um, in the Whitehall uh, laboratory. And when the plague struck, um, he also went to Albury where he meets up with Maury and they continue their experiments together. Now, sadly for Vaughan, um, uh, Thomas Vaughan, he inhales Quicksilver by accident, and that kills him. You know, mercury poisoning is highly toxic. Um, but <laughs> by doing one of these alchemical experiments or chemical experiments, um, one of our best known hermetic philosophers and alchemists uh, accidentally kills himself. Uh, Maury, ever um, generous, uh, knows that Vaughan is uh, not rich, has got no money, and in fact, uh, Sir Robert Morey pays for his funeral. Um, Vaughan uh, comes to our attention 
um, because he uh, translated one of the most uh, important Rosicrucian texts, um, which is entitled in English, to his fame and confession of the fraternity of the Rosy Cross. So Vaughan um, uh, had tr translated that um, from the original Latin uh, into modern English, and he, uh, he gave a quite an extensive preface to that, um, that work. So here you have um, uh, uh, Sir Robert Morey, a very intelligent individual who uh, is very closely associated with someone who's an apologist for Rosicrucianism. However, we've got to be very careful not to read too much into this because Vaughan himself says he is not a Rosicrucian. Um, he is defending the rights of Rosicrucians to study the way they want to study. So this is a, this is a reaction or a, a, a defense. It's a reaction against uh, the authorities trying to impose their belief system on uh, people who are interested in such things as uh, Rosicrucianism and uh, Hermeticism. Um, so the claim that uh, Sir Robert Morey was a uh, conduit in some way for Rosicrucianism into Freemasonry, I think is probably doubtful, but we've still got to take note of that fact um, because this is a time when things were, everything was in flux, the scientific, the, the, the scientific method hadn't really been introduced. Um, it was in fact um, uh, later introduced by the Royal Society. Um, before we leave that, and before we leave Sir Robert Murray and, and go on to talk a little bit about the Royal Society, I want to just mention that one of the meetings that Sir Robert Murray um, goes back to um, uh, in the Lodge in Edinburgh was um, and, uh, to attend the initiation of the King's physician, a chap called Maxwell, Thomas Maxwell, Dr. Thomas Maxwell. So he's initiated into the Lodge of Edinburgh in 1667, um, just after, sorry, 1647, um, not long after Sir Robert Morey himself, six years later. Maxwell is a noted hermeticist and alchemist also. So the connection of these um, intelligentsia who are interested in these things also takes place uh, in a Masonic setting. So it's not just in their laboratories or in their private life or in their letters to each other. They actually take these people into Freemasonry. The extent of, uh, of which their influence on, we're not ever going to know for sure, but we, ha we have to take account of the fact that we've got these Hermeticists and Rosicrucians or Rosicrucian apologists should put it, make that clear, um, running around within the very early Masonic lodges in Scotland. Um, the, the amount of research to be done um, on that dimension, I think is, is substantial. It's probably not going to ever be completed in, in my time, but uh, certainly we, we can start the ball rolling. And so that's why um, I'm grateful for the suggestion from the guys in Turkey and in South America for uh, in asking me to talk on this subject because it's, it's re-energized my interest um, in the subject. Um, so Sir Robert Murray, uh, we know he's, he's very involved in all sorts of different things, particularly uh, symbolism um, and the meaning of things. So when the Royal Society um, is first discussed by members of the intelligentsia um, in 1660 um, at Gresham College in London. Uh, in fact, in, in the meeting rooms of uh, a, a professor of geometry, uh, another little interesting possibility, uh, a, a professor of geometry called Lawrence Rook. Um, immediately after this um, meeting, uh, it's followed by a lecture given by Christopher Wren. And during the, co during the various conversations they have, it's, it's mentioned that, well, you know, there really is no forum for discussing whether anything's actually true or false, et cetera, et cetera. To cut a long story short, 12 of those people um, who met at Gresham College um, 
they decide they're going to uh, try and form a society. Um, and they, between them, between these 12, they decide they're going to draw up a list of 40 suitable gentlemen uh, who would be invited to join this new society. So here you have um, Sir Robert Murray, Freemason, and lo and behold, his good friend Alexander Bruce, by now the second Earl of Kincardine, um, the two of these, two of these who are members of the Lodge of Edinburgh, um, sorry, uh, one of those, Sir Robert Murray, and his good friend, whom he's explained Freemasonry to, are now members of this uh, very early uh, stage of forming the Royal Society. So they draw up a list of 40 eminent gentlemen that should be um, invited to join this new society. And one of those uh, 40 is Elias Ashmole. So Elias Ashmole, if you like, is, an, is also a Freemason, according to his diaries at least. Um, and so now we begin to see that this um, very important scientific or, uh, body Called, later called the Royal Society, um, has Freemasons in it right from the very beginning. And this is where we can see that um, Sir Robert Murray's influence is extremely important because it's him um, as an individual that petitions the king um, for um, a charter to make the society the Royal Society. That is under the direct patronage of the king of the country. And that, um, that uh, request to his king is granted and the Royal Society is born. And Sir Robert Morey, uh, as I say, Freemason and member of the Lodge of Edinburgh, is the first president. So what the Royal Society has done is it, it begins to establish um, what we now call the scientific method where experiments are, are conducted and an attempt to establish um, the truth of something by repeated experimentation begins. Up till that time, that point in time, uh, and for some to be in, uh, fair, admittedly for some considerable time afterwards, um, practically anything was up for grabs. You could investigate the occult, um, fairies, um, mermaids, all these subjects were legitimate um, subjects of inquiry by the Royal Society. But over time, uh, experience begins to show that experimentation shows what is possible and what is impossible. And so for me, this is where um, Sir Robert Morey is um, very important in the sense that he carries forward this investigative way of looking at the world. He's already experienced the hermetic and the alchemical um, what way of looking at the world. And now with the Royal Society, he's becoming a, a much more rigorous um, uh, investigator um, of the world. And as I say, he's instrumental in giving birth to the Royal Society, which is still with us today and is one of the preeminent um, uh, scientific bodies in the world. So again, another reason to admire uh, Sir Robert Morey and to investigate him and his um, Masonic uh, connections. Anyway, guys, thank you for listening. I hope you found that to be of interest. It was a little bit stuttery, but uh, let's hope that you found something uh, worthwhile listening to. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, again for a very interesting uh, uh, lecture. Uh, my Zoom is also going crazy somehow. I don't know why today is quite a strange uh, day with that. So uh, once again, um, this uh, topic, uh, very interesting one uh, regarding uh, Sir Moray's uh, um, history and the Royal Society has been uh, requested by our Turkish brothers and uh, brothers from South uh, America. Uh, like Chile, Argentina, Peru, and other uh, jurisdictions together in a combined letter from, the, from these jurisdictions. So uh, 
first of all, I'll ask them to take floors and uh, make uh, the questions they were they wanted to clarify. They had the uh, they wanted to learn more. So meanwhile, they are getting ready. Ready for this? Um, uh, Troy, please unmute yourself and floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you, Brother Cooper. That was excellent. Um, just a, a couple of things I observed um, uh, and lots of, because I, I travel and lecture quite a bit on the subject of esotericism and occultism. Um, and it's fascinating to see you show how at the founding of the Royal Society, uh, these, what I would call forgotten sciences or hermetic sciences, uh, at the time, they weren't forgotten sciences, they weren't hermetic sciences, they were just science. Um, and science hadn't coalesced itself around the, uh, the physical, rational areas that it has now, and the Royal Society has been pivotal in that. But there was a lot of knowledge that would now be considered a cult, that at the time, all those men of science were practicing that. Uh, Ashmole himself published the most important treatise on alchemy in English, the Theatricum Chemicum Britannicum. Uh, why do you think um, that the rational physical sciences sort of took precedence and, and took the scientific imagination and ran forward when all these other, I would call them the, the meaningful sciences or the sciences of applying, applying meaning, which were common amongst deists, you know, but this kind of fell out of favor so much so that now Freemasonry, probably the most eminent deist organization on the planet, if you bring up occult or esoteric subjects, most brethren, they don't want to even talk about it. Well, that's not Freemasonry. You know, go, go, go join the SRIA or SRIC or go talk to the Scottish Rite people. We don't want to hear about any of that over yeah. here. What yeah. what what is that what is that about? Can you can you shed some light, maybe? Uh, there's all sorts of uh, strands in there, you know. Um, uh, I think part part of part of this um, is Maury's um, own religious um, and beliefs, um, uh, his experience in life. Um, he lost his wife um, in in uh, terrible labor. Um, which killed her and the child, um, but he was a Stoic. Um, and so Stoicism, um, the essence of Stoicism basically says, um, the things that you cannot control, uh, you, you simply, there's no point in worrying about them. Um, they're gonna happen. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, if, you, if you worry about you know, what what's go is beyond your control, you're gonna be miserable. So, you know, focus on what you can control. And so Stoic philosophy in some ways could inform um, a scientist centuries later um, by saying to them, well, look, stop, stop uh, looking at things that you, know, you, you can't do anything about. You can't do anything about the tides. You can't do, you know, that kind, you can't, you can't stop weeds growing. Um, so there's no point in, in worrying about that. What you worry about is what you have control over. So in some ways, that's what the scientific method is about, isn't it? Um, I mean, I'm being very simplistic here, but um, then you've got the other um, social upheavals of the time. You've got the English Civil War, followed very, uh, the British Civil War, uh, followed very quick, and that's a religious war as well as a political war. Then very quickly after that, you have the Great Plague of London, you know, the Black Death. And then very quickly after that, you have the Great Fire of London. Um, and so the answers that, uh, that perhaps um, pre-Royal pre Society people, um, the things they saw were horrific, you know, mass deaths, um, from from re religious wars, from plague, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that perhaps um, the, the 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 church's view of the world just didn't seem to be valid anymore. Um, the, the, the the accepted way of the world was called into question in short order, uh, you know, one after the other, you know, war, death, fire, you know. 
it must have shattered all sorts of illusions about a, a stable society. So that may have been um, sort of like an emotional impulse um, uh, for the scientific method. Um, as to what we've lost, lost within Freemasonry today, um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, we no longer look at um, uh, the, uh, the esoteric, uh, dare, I, dare I say it, the spiritual elements um, of, of Freemasonry anymore. Um, and that is, that is partly due, I think, to the more secular world that we live in, um, which is also part of um, our educational system where um, looking at religion um, as a valid subject has now virtually disappeared from the school curriculum. Um, you quote, uh, uh, people who can quote the Bible tend to be people of my age or our age, shall we say. So um, the whole background um, today is completely different. Society is completely different from the time that uh, people, um, they're, and I, we've talked about this from the time that the original rituals appear. So um, understanding um, the hermetic, uh, esoteric, spiritual elements of Freemasonry, nobody except for a, 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 a limited number, I have to say, um, who take the time and trouble to investigate that, that's why people simply aren't interested. They don't have the knowledge or the ability to discuss it. And I mean, I like you, I've seen it. You go to a lodge, you, you, can we talk a little bit about the esoteric content of the second degree? And you just see eyes glazing over all around the lodge. Oh, what, what, what are you talking about? You know, let's get down and get a beer. You know? <laughs> so that's unfortunate, but there's a whole host of reasons for that. But yeah, good question. Troy, anything? You're okay? I'm well, okay. I, I, I mean, I, I, could, I could follow that up. Like uh, one of the things I'll point sure. out to the people in the room is that okay. at the time Freemasonry was on the ascendant during this very tumultuous time, especially in England, but United Kingdom in general, everything at the, at, that we were discussing at that time was cutting edge. This was all very marginal, thin edge of the wedge, cutting edge material and now uh, it, part of our attraction is this is an anachronism and i i want to know how, when did we sort of turn our back on 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 looking at this uh, cutting edge of 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 uh, religious tolerance and that sort of thing uh, i mean I don't necessarily think that's true everywhere, and there are lodges here and there that 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 might buck that trend. But the, I mean, the 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 exception proves that the rule is the case, and I I just want to know, you know, that it, it, it maybe in this room that kind of falls on deaf ears. There again, we're a bunch of academics in here, but it, I, yeah. I just find it fascinating that here we're talking about all these guys that were the leading mm -hmm. minds at the time. And they were all interested in getting together and talking about this stuff. And now, uh, you know, we want to serve pancake breakfast and that sort of thing. I, I, don't get me wrong. No. I love my craft. I just, <laughs> I want to know why can't we talk about this stuff? Well, as I say, I think it's, it, it's quite simple. A, a lot of our members don't have the ability, don't have the interest. And that's down to the society in which we live. I mean, let's, let's be brutally frank. The capitalist system doesn't have any time for airy fairy Rosicrucian hermeticism. Um, that what? How does that lead them to make a, a, a healthy profit for the for the corporation and for the shareholders? And so, you know, these kind of subjects, even even um, associated subjects like ordinary history, ordinary history is slowly but surely disappearing from the curriculum. Um, study of the classics of, of, of Greek, Roman, Egyptian, all that, can, you, that it's now a minority uh, academic subject. These are all tiny little things. Whereas before it was, it was one of the largest areas of study at university. So the time, times have changed substantially. 
and with that, um, with that educational system no longer teaching these subjects, people simply aren't uh, equipped unless they teach themselves. People, our, our members today, simply aren't equipped to discuss that with anyone. And that's why they, they don't want to know. You know. You're talking about something I don't understand and, and I've got no knowledge of. It's, it's, I'm afraid it's brutally frank. Yeah, you know? no, thanks, 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 Robert. I just, I, yeah. I like to yeah. hear it put in those terms. You know. Yeah, and let's let's also be brutally frank as well that um, our uh, the 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 leaders of the craft, and I'm not going to point any fingers, but the leaders of the craft don't educate the membership. They don't offer any education uh, whatsoever. Um, the the, the uh, if you want to be educated about Freemasonry, go to Amazon.com. And that's where you will get mis your Masonic education from, you yeah. know? And that's sad. That really is quite sad because we've got non-Masons writing books about Freemasonry that we buy. And then we, we suddenly think, oh, I know all about Freemasonry because a non-Mason's told me about it. And I've lined his pockets in the process. You know? Right. So, <laughs> so when, the, when, all the, when all the leading Masonic scholars aren't Freemasons, um, you know, yeah. that's, it's, a, it's an interesting commentary. I appreciate your thoughts on this subject. Uh, and I also appreciate uh, rooms like this where these things can be discussed because uh, it's, it's my intent to kind of push and prod. I, I kind of confront this difficulty just by being out there about my interests. And, um, you know, I, I, maybe I take advantage of the tolerance of Freemasonry in order to push my own agenda, which is, you know, every person should be exploring this aspect of themselves because, um, you know, the, 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 the seven liberal arts and sciences aren't the end, but even that, like you point out, Brother Cooper, who really studies formal rhetoric any longer? Um, and, and you could see it Agreed. in our, in our political discourse and whatnot. So thank you very much for your commentary. Sure, my pleasure, my pleasure. Definitely, definitely. Floor is uh, very liberal in this particular room, especially. So uh, <laughs> you can put out <laughs> your personal agenda, which is quite very interesting, as we discussed last time. Uh, and uh, about the non-Masons writing about the Masonic stuff, uh, if we remember uh, some exposés have been uh, written by them, which have served quite an interesting uh, sources for masons later on to write based on the exposés and interpreting something from from those mm -hmm. uh, even saving or preserving something so uh, everything yeah. has its own role I guess so mm -hmm. uh, I guess uh, Abraham wants to follow up on this issue uh, that uh, Troy has raised and uh, Abraham if you want to if you are here just unmute yep. yourself go ahead Can you please yes, yes so you're here uh, uh, Brother Bob started to very quickly touch on it, and that is that um, I guess that's what the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite is for, and that's the answer you're going to be told that if you want to explore esotericism, you have to, you have to mute the other device. I guess something is repeating in your voice. Hold on a second. Let me let me, let me turn that off. Hold on. Get rid of that device. All right, is it better now? Yeah. So, so I guess you know the the ancient and accepted Scottish rite is the place you go to get the esoterics, and the Blue Lodge is where you go to do business. Okay, um, in your part of the world, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> I, I say that because. The, the Scottish Rite didn't appear in Scotland until the 1850s. Um, right. And so um, I think the, the question that, uh, that Troy was asking is, you know, when, when did um, we stop talking about the esoteric? Um, and I suppose the, the second part is, when did that, that kind of esoteric discussion go to the Scottish Rite? Yeah, and I, I would here, here in North America, 
the advent and the importation of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, um, it just gave a new degree system and a new way outlet for the capitalist uh, mindset of the higher ups in the fraternity to say, mm, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. the craft yeah. will be business for conferring the, the the symbolic degrees and after you finish the craft lodge go explore the york right go explore the scottish right if you want more esoterics and uh and it was a a, a way for more money yeah I, actually that's a good point because if, if people were busy doing other things within freemasonry they weren't sitting in the lodge looking in depth at what the lodge was doing and what the ritual meant, they were busy claiming the greasy pole up to the 33rd degree. That might well be the accidental consequence um, of, the, uh, of the Scottish Rite's arrival by making the, the esoteric element of the, the craft lodge less relevant. Uh, because, I mean, you can only, there's only so much time in the day and if you're attending um, everything in the Scottish Rite and everything in the York Rite, you're not sitting in the lodge saying, well, what does that word mean? Well, so, yeah, that's right. a good point. Never thought about it like that before. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and that's why side orders are such a big thing, especially here in North America. Uh, you know, all the, you know, litany uh, list of different side orders that you can join. And, and I know I'm going to catch flack from some of my, Florida brothers here because we all belong to all of them but you know you get different esoterics from each of the appendant bodies and uh, especially when you start dabbling into the allied Masonic degrees when you go into the uh, uh, into the uh, uh, orders of Athelstan and you know uh, various other uh, side orders I mean there's there's endless endless amounts of esoterics that you can do but i think that uh the the short end of it uh, troy is that um for uh, for us here in north america it probably the interest in uh esotericism within the craft lodge probably left the craft lodge when the ancient and accepted scottish rite came and said okay if you want the esoterics come to college come to university which is what we are and you can get the esoterics here yeah well that's why you know i've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about trying to understand the esoteric content of the earliest rituals you know that we we, we discussed a couple was it a couple of weeks ago or i can't remember yes it was yeah. three weeks ago yeah. round yeah but you see the problem is that that those very early rituals are virtually unknown um, uh, I mean, to be fair, they are obscure in the sense that they are they are handwritten rituals that are stuck in uh, various uh, archives, um, so they're hard to get hold of and hard to study. But um, there is very definitely uh, esoteric content there. Um, but again, you know, you get you speak to guys today. Oh, I don't want to talk about old rituals. I just want to talk about you know. You know we're, how we're going to pay the the next insurance bill, you know, and I know it's important, but it kind of squeezes the time that you've got to discuss what I would consider to be important things. There we go. That's, that's, what that's is the earliest? Um, yeah. What is the earliest ritual that is, uh, to your knowledge, what is the earliest ritual that we actually have record of? Oh, that yeah, that's. That's the Edinburgh Register House manuscript. It's uh, 1696. So it's a little bit, you know, it's after Maury's time. It's after the Royal Society has been founded. But it's quite clear from that ritual that it's it's being copied from somewhere else. So that, you know, that, that kind of means that, that and, and we know from things like the Shaw Statutes, he's telling them to, to remember what's gone before. And yeah, you know, so we know that there's a substantial amount of stuff that's uh, that's being memorized. It's only yeah. when we get towards the end of the 17th century that you have um, more educated people, probably, who think, "Well, I'm going to write some of this down. I don't have to memorize it all." 
and that's almost certainly how the, the early rituals come about. But even then, they're, they're, they're fairly incomplete. Um, but in, in my opinion, if you start at the beginning with those rituals and then you look at um, developments subsequent to that, you can learn a lot, um, but we, but nobody, nobody explains any of this to the members. You see, that's the problem. You know, as I say, they buy a book on Amazon and they know it all. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Troy. Uh, uh, let's give uh, floor first to Christian Torres, and then we come back to you. Hello there. Good afternoon, uh, brother Bob. Thank you for your very good presentation. And yes, well, I, I want my initial question was to ask you on the um, where we can find this uh, esoteric uh, uh, information or from the early days. But I guess you answered it's Amazon. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of it. Unfortunately, and, and this is the only downside that I can see from uh, from using uh, Zoom. Um, I mean, obviously, there's quite a lot that we simply can't go into in in, in a public forum. Uh, unfortunately, right. so I, although I can I, I can I can sort of hint or or guide you in, in certain directions, I can't discuss it in detail. Um, and no. so that's one of that's one of the, one of the presentations. Um, that can really only be given in a tile lodge, basically. So, we should have uh, uh, another one where we can discuss this. Uh, and, uh, it has to be it has to be secure, though. I think yes. Zoom. I think Zoom are working on end-to-end -end encryption, just like WhatsApp. Um, I hear. I don't know if it's true or not, but if they're going to have end-to-end -end encryption like WhatsApp, then that would that would be a game changer for uh, discussing um, um, sensitive things, would it not be? Right. Yeah, but well, still, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. No. Yeah, Christian, sorry, George, go ahead. No, no, no just, uh, well, that was my initial question. And now the, I have some curiosity about the fact that uh, he was, uh, Roar Moray was a spy and there's not much said. So if you have any other information about that. Yeah. Thank well, you, brother. Once, once, once I finish the paper that I left a while ago, but yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I'm just being lazy by not doing it, to be honest. It's, uh, so. You're not lazy at all. <laughs> <laughs> we are enjoying a lot of your time and you're doing a great job for every participant, I think. And not only because the recordings are being watched every day, the numbers are going and going up. And I receive a lot of feedback, positive feedback that, your lectures are all the recordings that are put out there is so interesting and informative so to so many people and so uh you're not lazy at all <laughs> at <laughs> least i don't think so i, I hope uh, participants will agree with me yeah. so uh christian thank you and aubrey floor is yours brother thank you um first of all Superb as ever, Robert, lecture, thank you very much. Coming back onto the, um, the, the ancient and accepted Scottish rite, the Grand Lodge of Chile here in Chile use that particular ritual. I'm um, of initiated in, in and, and of course, Grand Lodge of Scotland. But for interest, I affiliated to a Grand Lodge of Chile Lodge in my hometown. And um, they have this. Mm. Okay. I don't know if you can read it, but I'll read it to you. It's made by a fellow called written by a fellow called Oswood Worth. Oh, right, okay. And they have to, a full book for the apprentices. Another one for the fellow craft. Another one for the master mason. 
all full of the sort of stuff that you've been talking about. Um, it's, I find it astonishing. Personally, I, I, I don't enjoy it. I much prefer Rhino to Scotland Freemasonry to, but it is, it's, it's a fact of life that uh, to progress through the various degrees under this ancient and accepted uh, Scottish rite within Chile. This is for, formally published, but translated by, Worth's document was translated into Spanish and then amended to make it suitable for Chilean use. I found it uh, difficult to believe that some poor apprentice has got to spend months and months and years and years before he, he, he's, he's, he's accepted sufficiently to become a fellow craft. Then he goes to the same book all or, or another book all over again and then the Master Mason. The result being that I've noticed uh, in particularly in the lodge here, the, um, the, the dropout rate of um, um, initiates or members is huge. Mm. It's huge, which is completely different, of course, to the Ronald de Scotland system. With, I mean, theoretically, within uh, a month, I suppose it is the minimum. I can't remember, Bob, but uh, theoretically, you, you could be an apprentice, and a month later, you could be a, um, a master mason. Um, I think it's got to be a month between, in Scotland, it's got right. to be a minimum. But, but, but yeah, you know, it's, 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 yeah. In comparison. Yes, absolutely. Not Thank you, Aubrey. Can I intervene or are you have uh no, by all means, carry on. I finished. I just wanted to make the comment about the ancient and accepted Scottish right. That's what we perform here in Georgia as well. So uh, before I give the floor uh, to Troy uh, again, uh, there are two questions which I received, uh, one I received from Brother Istvan, who is here, but I received it by email uh, days ago, so I have to ask, read it uh, here, uh, then I'll have uh, another, which is in the chat. So uh, the first question uh, from Brother Istvan is that uh, whether they have, or you, in that case, Bob, uh, in Scotland, in the craft lodges, chamber of reflection or not? That's the first question. Um, the short answer is no, most lodges don't have that, um, but some do. And the problem uh, <laughs> when we're talking about Scotland is that it depend, it's up to the lodge to decide these things. So um, every, every lodge in Scotland can have its own ritual. So there is no standard ritual for Scottish lodges. So in theory, I mean, I remember, I was, I'm, I'm the founder member of Lodge Edinburgh Castle, um, a, a past master there. Um, but when the lodge was being founded, um, they formed a committee uh, to decide what ritual they were going to have. And so they, they took some ritual from um, one lodge, but then they wrote, rewrote or added new ritual um, to the existing one. So you have a situation where in Scotland, it's not possible to, um, to tell a lodge, this is what you must do. Some lodges very deliberately choose not to have a chamber of reflection. Some lodges um, do, and you have other lodges that um, they will use the, the idea of a lodge of reflection or a chamber of reflection um, completely separate from the lodge meetings, and that's entirely um, under the control of the proposer and seconder. So the short answer is it depends on the lodge in Scotland. And it's their own choice. Okay, I yeah. think uh, the question is answered. Istvan, uh, you are here, and if you want to add up something or make it uh, any clarification question or something, you're... Um, 
more than welcome, please do so. Before that, uh, we received a question here by Erjan. Uh, David, I have a question. Okay, uh, at the beginning, there was one or a couple of largest groups, etc. But in time, until uh, until now, the organization grew in numbers, and also the numbers of different rights increased. What do you think about this diversity in rights? Does this cause important problems regarding relationships uh, between brothers in different rights? Or the main essence to be protected is esotericism in the craft. Thank you. Mm. Well, in, in some ways, uh, Freemasonry has been a victim of its own success, hasn't it? Um, I think part of, of the, the development, if you like, uh, is, is, is natural in the sense that you've got, if, you, if all you have are three degrees at lodge level, you can only have one master of the lodge per year. Um, whereas when you have a grand lodge, then all of a sudden you've got another, another avenue that you can um, explore. So what's happened is I think that as more and more people have joined Freemasonry, they all want to be involved. They don't want to just sit um, and watch the degrees being performed. They want to participate somehow or other. And so in order to accommodate more and more people joining, um, more and more ceremonies have been invented. And I use that word deliberately, invented. Um, and that's, that's because, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, uh, Scottish Freemasonry and indeed other orders that are not Masonic, um, like the Free Gardeners, uh, the Free Fishermen, um, the uh, Horsemen, uh, the Free Carters, uh, the Hammermen, um, these organisations developed directly from a working man's daily life. So a stonemason, um, they got together and they created their ceremonies based on their experience of working during the day on a church or castle or whatever. In the same way, free gar or gardeners um, got together um, as groups um, and used their experience of um, horticulture um, to develop ceremonies um, uh, based on what they did during the day. And so that went on um, on and on and on um, throughout Scotland and all, all sorts of trades developed their own uh, ceremonies based on what their working lives were. That's quite unlike anywhere else in the world, as I understand it, um, where, for example, the Odd Fellows, um, the, um, the Shepherds, the Foresters, all these organizations are pure invention. You know, gentlemen with leisure time decided that they didn't want to join the Freemasons. Um, they wanted to have their own organization um, so that they could be in charge of it. They could be the Grand Master. So they invented um, these organizations like the Odd Fellows, etc. So that's a sharp contrast between Scotland and, and particularly England where Scotland were using actual working knowledge, practical knowledge to, to, to devise ceremonies, whereas in England, they were um, pure invention, not based on anybody's practical experience. So I think there is a research project up for grabs here. Are the other branches of Freemasonry, such as the Scottish Rite, um, uh, and indeed most of the York Rite, um, in fact, yeah, nearly all of it, are these uh, pure invention for, the, for a similar purpose. Don't get me wrong, they're all very worthy, but unlike the first three degrees, which spring directly from the working stonemason in Scotland, are all the other branches of Freemasonry pure invention in order to accommodate ever increasing numbers of new members? Possible? I mean, if we could look statistically, if we could look statistically at the intake of um, new new people into into Freemasonry, I think you might find that fairly soon after there's a 
sudden spike in uh, the, um, the development of a new order or a new branch of Freemasonry, you've got to give, you've got to give all these people something to do. And if, if all there is is a, is a craft lodge, that's not enough. So anyway, that's just a thought. It's just a thought. I'm, don't, I'm not saying that that's what happened, but it would be it would be worthwhile investigating. I think. Thank you, uh, Troy. Floor is yours, and there are several questions in the chat room, uh, which I will try to read out loud. You come back to me. This is great. Uh, I'm not going to speak on the same topic from before, um, uh, Brother Cooper. So. Uh, these earlier rituals uh, was evolved evolved from uh, traditional operative Masonic craft. Um, are there are there good works, uh, written works that will lead a student of the three degrees? Uh, a, a rather a famous brother of mine uh, says he can only count to three, and so. Uh, no room for Scottish Rite or York Rite for him. Uh, is there good written work on the mysticism of the birth life death cycle of the three degrees that we practice that isn't specific to any mystical tradition that you're aware of? Um, yeah, um, there is. There, there have been a few papers um, written. Uh, um, the, uh, some of them are in uh, in the trend, in the proceedings of uh, Quater Coronati, Quater Coronati Lodge. There's a few papers in there. I myself have scribbled um, a few a few things that uh, go into it a bit, um, particularly the, the the parallel organization of the three gardeners, which followed a very similar esoteric path, um, and actually were parallel. Uh, in time uh, with Freemasonry and its development. So sometimes I think, so to answer your question, there are, there are some things like that available, but you've got, to, you've got to dig for them and you've, perhaps you've got to know where to look for them. That's the problem. And this comes back to the difficulty that you have, that if you are interested in this subject, there's very few places that you can go and ask that question. Um, and I mean, with the best will in the world, you go to your Grand Lodge, I don't know if, if they would be able to answer that question for you. Some research lodges like Quater Coronati Lodge certainly could, but in general, I don't think there is a central point of contact for, for people who are interested in that, that aspect. So. The reason I ask is I, I think that the, the traditional three degree system is a is a complete system of mysticism unto itself. And um, in my own practice, I've sort of evolved that and developed that. And I know other Masons that have too. We kind of beat and compare notes. Um, but then we've added so much that our predecessors might have known or might have practiced from the Western esoteric tradition. And, and I just think masonry is a particularly useful lens to look at that. Um, any comment yeah. on that? Yeah, uh, the, there's no doubt that um, when you look at the old rituals, the earliest rituals, it is very, very clear that there's, there's been a lot of tinkering with the rituals uh, over, the, over the centuries. Um, all sorts of additions. We can see um, the addition of, of, of certain modern practices. We, we, we can tell when they suddenly first appear in the ritual. So you can actually usually tell which decade um, some elaborations have been made to the ritual. Um, and you, you can see that over time, these additions have completely buried um, the esoteric content I have to say, though, we do we do live in a day and age where uh, things are things tend to be taken at a superficial level. Um, even even uh, give the best example I can think of off the top of my head is um, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Say, um, whether the whether the Good Samaritan um, lived and what his name was. Um, 
what his occupation was, how many children he had, all that is irrelevant. It's not necessary for the parable. It's the message that the parable conveys that's important. But nowadays people tend to look at the, the pure surface of the story and, you know, and the story is all that's important. It's not the actual moral element of the story. And I think we don't teach um, modern Freemasons. I don't think anymore we, we teach um, that the, the words carry a separate, uh, hidden meaning. And that's why we get some guys who are extremely eloquent. They can stand up and they can deliver the, word, the, the ritual word perfect from beginning to end. But you ask them, well, what does it mean? Well, everybody knows what it means. You can read it for yourself, you know, and that's the problem. It's superficial. There's no depth. There's no explanation of what words mean. And more importantly, in my opinion, there is no explanation as to why linking a series of words together um, make them uh, important. So we have this this basic uh, idea, that here's a book, that's the ritual, learn it, and if you learn it well, you'll understand it. And that's the presumption that we have, that if you learn it, you will understand it. And that's just a way of, that's a cop-out, it's a way of people not having to explain it, because it's all written down in the book. And if you can't, if you can't understand it, then that's your fault, not mine, you know? That's the attitude, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, the questions in the chat room, uh, Norman is here with us, but uh, as he wants me to read it, I understand. He hasn't uh, raised his hand. Oh. Bob, what is the law? Oh, Norman, please go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, well, I'll, take it. I mean I'll take it. It gives me an opportunity again to say thank you to Bob for uh, giving us terrific um, entertainment and education and uh, uh, I'm so grateful as I'm sure all, all the participants you know are um, for everything you do so uh, keep, please keep doing it. Um, I've got two questions I think they're fairly short. Um, in uh, England Mark Masonry is a completely separately organized a degree. So unlike, as you've explained in Scotland, uh, the entry to mark may be through the craft, it may be through the Royal Arch. Um, in England, it is a completely separate uh, degree. And it's one that uh, I, I have joined, but only really in the last four years. So I'm a very inexperienced Mark Mason. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that the triangle is never a mark which can be chosen uh, by a uh, by a fellow craft because that's uh, uh, an overseer's uh, 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 <clears throat> item of recognition of approval a stamp of approval the pentagram is almost entirely triangles which seems a little bit at odd to what I've learned so far. So uh, can you shed some light on that, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, um, the, well, first and foremost, the, you know, I've just been talking about um, things coming out of uh, a Scottish working experience, a, a daily working life. Um, and the mark is, is probably the classic example of that, um, albeit a bit later. Um, we know that what actually happened with the mark in England was um, uh, about uh, eight or nine guys um, from Aberdeen went to London to confer the degree on some Freemasons in London. And of course, they got a, char a Scottish charter. And all of a sudden, Mark Lodge started appearing all over England with charters from a Royal Arts chapter, oddly enough, called Bon Accord in Aberdeen, um, they were given charters by this Royal Arts chapter and they started to appear all over um, England, uh, particularly in, in places like Lancashire and Cheshire. Um, and uh, that, that was the impetus for forming the Mark Grand Lodge of England and Wales. 
um, because they were obviously and probably correctly wanted to control what was happening on their on their territory, um, so to speak. But the the mark, um, and now we're talking about the Masons, uh, the Maury's mark made of, up of the triangles. Um, is that what you're referring to? His mark. Yes, the the image that you put up um, in, uh, in in your um, your presentation um, uh, was was the pentagram, and that yeah, was yeah. triangle upon triangle upon triangle, apart from a little image, sort of you know in in the centre. But um, yeah, that yeah. seemed to be too many triangles and therefore at <laughs> what I've learned. So. Yeah, um, I think the difference is that he doesn't use anything that's an equilateral triangle. Uh, that's the difference. It's the equilateral triangle that's crucial to the mark. So he, he didn't use that. He didn't use that kind of triangle. Okay, that, that's perfectly fine. Thank you. My second question, probably even shorter, um, the image that you have in your background, um, can you explain what lodge that is, what time period and um, uh, where it's located? Yeah, that's, that's a photograph that was taken, um, it was taken in 1904 um, in Lodge Waverley 597 uh, in Edinburgh, here in Edinburgh. Um, and uh, what, what it was was there was a, a travelling vaudeville act called the William Walker uh, Company from New York. Um, were travelling Britain and uh, uh, when they were in Edinburgh, um, uh, all uh, nine of them were initiated into, into that lodge uh, in, in 1904, as I say. Um, very famous um, black um, uh, actors and musicians. They had a, a summer season, as they called it here uh, in Edinburgh, uh, at the King's Theatre, I think it was, where they performed June, July and August before going home. Um, and that's the photograph after the initiation ceremony. Um, in, in, you know, I think that would be, I think it was in June uh, 1904. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, very interesting as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just went through all the texts and comments. There are some uh, simple uh, discussion, uh, simple to the set. I mean, the, the participants are uh, uh, responding to each other. So I don't see the, those questions are like about one day Masons are too much of relevance uh, for the discussion because there are some who are made uh, in one day to the highest degrees. So uh, yeah, that was following up of the discussion that this is the part is being kind of getting lost uh, in between. And what about those one day guys? <laughs> okay, so um, I think uh, again, we made it. In oh, sorry, Aubrey, floor is yours, please go ahead. Yes, can I make a quick comment about the Pentagon? Okay. Um, my grandfather was a, a Mason. As I mentioned before, in Scotland, I think he was uh, initiating in a in a lodge in Preston Ponds. But on mm -hmm. his watch chain, he always wore he wore the pentagon. I'm pretty certain, well, I'm not a member, but I think it's related to the Royal Arts degree and used by the Royal Arts degree. Um, these days in Scotland, yeah, it's actually um, uh, it's actually the excellent master's degree. Excellent master's um, degree. Yeah, so in, it's possible in a Royal Arts chapter in Scotland to take uh, three degrees, the Mark degree. If you haven't already taken into in, in the lodge, uh, you have to take it in the Royal Arts chapter, um, and then it's the excellent masters, and then the, the Royal Arch. So. It, the Royal Arch in Scotland has a, a three degree system, just like the, the three lodges. Um, and I know that there are, there are not that many parts of the world that um, do the three degrees in the Royal Arch anymore. I think Canada probably. Um, we do in Chile. We yeah. do in Chile. 
how you do in Chile, right? But for whatever reason, um, the mark, uh, the excellent masters, they never had the mark in England as part of the Royal Arch, as Norman has just been explaining. Um, but it's not that long ago, something like 30, 40 years ago, the excellent masters was dropped from the Royal Arch um, series. And so you only take the Royal Arch degree when you go to a Royal Arch chapter in England. I think Bristol um, still have um, the excellent masters though, but uh, that's my understanding anyway. Thank you very much. Okay. Sadly, sadly, um, that, that watch chain was, which was um, made from the braided hair of um, my grandmother, um, we gave it to his son and uh, the house was robbed and it was stolen. Tremendous yeah. loss for the family. But I yeah. still have a photograph of him, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, unfortunately, yeah. but okay. Okay, uh, thank you, Aubrey. Uh, Abraham, floor is yours. And uh, yes, we have like 10 more minutes uh, and we are exactly in two hours today. Early beer. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. Um, so, um, with, uh, with permission from uh, Brother Bob, if he would entertain a kind of off-topic question. Um, so the other day I got into a rather um, heated discussion with, um, with one of these um, clandestine organization uh, people. And it started going back to the question of uh, birth, right or birth certificate or you know what he basically was getting at is who authorized the uh the lodges in scotland and what i tried to essentially explain to this individual is that uh because basically what what he tried to allude to is that uh is that it it came from uh from the moors and from the uh from egypt is yeah, and I said, look, we're talking about the organization of Freemasonry, not Masonry. We're talking about Freemasonry, and Freemasonry started in it started in Scotland, and there's there's documentation to, to prove it. And the the question keeps coming back to well, who 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 bur who started the first lodge, or you know wh where did it come from? So. Uh, I, I know we've had these discussions before, Brother Bob. Maybe you can revisit it and kind of take me back to that place so I can be, you know, better uh, equipped to answer these questions. Um, well, I think we can we we can answer that fairly fairly easily because we we come back to William Shaw. Um, uh, Rob, Bob, Bob, uh, please. Uh... Uh, help with uh, help help your mic. It it sounds oh. strange. All right. Uh, I think I just need. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, se seems good now. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to go. I could go back to uh, fourteen seventy five, where um the earliest organization of stonemasons in Scotland was authorized, but that was m more of a guild. I, I therefore think that when we're talking about lodges, we have to go back to uh, William Shaw, who um, writes to every lodge in Scotland. And of course, he's, he is in many ways acting as a grand master by giving them instructions as to what they will do from now on. So, and, and, and there's an implied threat that this is what you're going to do from now onwards or else. So he, he's, he's cracking the whip. Um, so he's authorizing them to continue to exist, but if they uh, are, are in any way naughty, he's going, he's going, to, um, he's going to have them. He's, he's going to take their charter away, essentially. Um, he's going right. to make it illegitimate. So this, and I think this is where this whole idea of legitimacy comes from, um, where somebody must have authorized these 
organisation, the, these lodges, to exist. And I think William Shaw is doing just that. He's saying, OK, you can exist provided you do what you're told. And the, these are the things that you're going to do. So I think that's where it comes from. But with Shaw, we're talking again about Freemasonry, not Mason, not the actual craft. Yeah. I, I, oh, yeah. We're we're definitely talking about the craft. We're talking about stone masons. Stone okay. masons. Stone masons lodges. He he writes to them and he tells them, "This is what you're going to do from now on." And as I say, there's an implied threat. The difference is, of course, that these lodges, um, over time, morph into modern Masonic lodges. Some uh, some completely lose. Oh, every single stonemason disappears. In fact, some of them are so annoyed with these non-stonemasons, they up and go away and, and form another operative lodge. So it's uh, they've been authorised by William Shaw, they've been hijacked by speculative masons, but the legitimacy still exists. That's the point. As long as you've got a continuity from the original authority, Shaw in this case, as long as you've got that continuity, you retain legitimacy, which is why the speculatives didn't form new lodges, they took over existing ones in order to main, maintain the continuity and therefore the continuity of legitimacy. Right, because the argument keeps coming back to, well, at some point, the stonemasons stole the knowledge from the Egyptians. In other words, the Egyptians passed it on to, to okay. the Scottish stonemasons, the, the, the skills and the knowledge that was necessary, the geometry and the trigonometry yeah. necessary to build these great edifices that were building yeah. Europe. Yeah, well, this is, this is exactly what we've been talking about. You, you now have come up with, come up to, come fronted the problem of belief uh, as opposed to fact. So right. if, if, if the idea that the Egyptians transferred their knowledge to Scottish stonemasons, I would like to see the evidence that supports that. If there's no evidence, then it's simply an opinion. And right. an opinion, anybody can have an opinion. Um, we <laughs> as a Masonic historian, I like to think that I can um, sort of point people in the direction of supporting evidence. Um, rather than just giving a whole load of opinions. And this is, and, and I understand the attraction of, of that. That's a lovely romantic story. But we've got to be careful because, as I've said before, if you get carried away with the romanticism of these stories, um, you're starting from a point of um, error. You can speculate on things, but if you speculate on, on basically on opinion rather than fact, you cannot you cannot get back to a factual position. All you can do is um, continue to make errors because the basis of what you're doing is based on an error or or based on something for which no evidence exists. And right. so it's a, it's very difficult. And I mean, you know, as a Masonic historian, I'm very conscious of the, the problem that this creates because if I give absolutely cast iron 100 percent proof that what your friend is talking about is absolute rubbish as i should i as a freemason do that to somebody's beliefs so it, it, it's a quandary it really is a quandary because he's entitled to his beliefs does that allow me to destroy his beliefs simply because i'm a hard-headed historian Difficult, difficult. Now, if you can discuss that in a friendly way, okay. Which but... I try to, which I try to do, but again, these these discussions get very heated because it, it all comes back to this issue of legitimacy and and clandestine organizations which claim to be uh, legal and have authority. And when I when I confront yeah. them, try to explain that no your organization is in fact not recognized. It is completely fabricated out of thin air. There's no tracing back to, uh, there's no continuity from anywhere. It was a 
fabrication out of thin air, uh, then it comes into these discussions. Well, you, you European and American Freemasons stole it all from the Egyptians and from the Nuwabians anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, you're never, I mean, we, you can take it even further back than that. And you can take it back to the, to the Neolithic age in Scotland, if you like. So we've got these standing stones scattered all over the country. Um, and so the Neolithic Scots um, are probably the first people in, in, well, all over Europe, but in Scotland in this case, that were erecting standing stones to, to mark the solar sol solstice and the, win you know, and, uh, the winter solstice and, the, and the, whatever. So they were doing things as well. So maybe the Egyptians stole it from the Scots, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> where, 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 where are we going to end, you know? Yeah, we can we can take it forever, but hey, thanks for uh, entertaining that. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and uh, Bob published a uh, uh, post-it. I think uh, that will be better word for that. A very interesting uh, comparison of uh, dervishes and uh, Freemasonry on his personal uh, uh, Masonic author Facebook uh, page, and it is very interesting. Uh, reading, so I would recommend to go back on uh, uh, Bob's page, and there are many others, but this one was very interesting to read. Uh, someone has the microphone on, so Abraham, could, I'll mute you now. Uh, Frank, Frank W, DW, please, floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Abraham, I like to think that Freemasonry <clears throat> is simply evolution of all those ancient things up until the point that the facts or recorded facts, or then then emerge. Um, can I just explore one other thing with you, Bob? Um, when uh, William Shaw introduced his statutes, clearly he was putting down uh, a minimum standard. Is there record and evidence of 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 lodges that did actually keep minutes anyway, in spite you know before he brought his statutes in place? No. No, none at all. And that's, that's almost certainly, um, the minutes are almost certainly a direct consequence of his statutes. Um, and that's, that's when they suddenly start appearing. Before that, there is nothing, nothing at all. But clearly, lodges existed before he introduced his statutes. Uh, the very first one, which we read uh, the other week, um, instructs the lodges um, to um, memorize all their previous rules and regulations. And it also refers to the, these previous lodges, that is the pre-Shaw lodges. Um, it's clear that they're already taking oaths um, be between the brethren, um, you know, stonemason brethren of these lodges. So just in a couple of sentences, he's, he's, he addresses the issue of these lodges that existed before written records come into being. And I suppose that's you know if you don't have to if you don't have to do something, you know until until somebody uh, bigger and meaner than you comes along and tells you you've got to, well you're not going to bother are you? And I think that's exactly what happened. They were just well, whatever. This is our organisation. Why do we need to keep written records? We know what we're doing. But he came along and he told them no 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 can't do that anymore. Thanks. Okay. All right. All done. No more. Okay. So, sorry. Looks sorry, like David is frozen. Oh, right. Okay. I think he might be having to restart. All ah, right, he's disappeared. Right. Yeah. So we'll have to talk amongst ourselves. Oh dear. We have, we have one away. As the host what, right. what what will we do as Freemasons when left to our own devices? We'd probably well, we start about, another outer order. Well, we can talk about David as he's not here. <laughs> he's, he's been sent to Coventry. Job. He's good he's doing a good job, isn't he? Yeah, he's doing an excellent job. Uh, unfortunately, the software just sent him to Coventry. All right, he's back. 
Ja. Sorry about that. I don't know. Uh, I guess our <laughs> name is taking us. <laughs> uh, gave, us a, today... gave us a chance to talk about you. That's all. <laughs> okay. I will leave you now. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, sorry about that. Uh, Okay, I think no more questions, and uh, definitely I can leave you alone if you want to talk about anything. <laughs> so, uh, should I wrap up? I think I don't see any hands uh, raised, and uh, that gives me all legitimacy to say that today's lecture is over, and uh, I hope um, to see you all on... Uh, on uh, it is on Wednesday, and we will have um, a very interesting topic, which has been uh, uh, proposed by Bob. Uh, it is about the River Valley Road uh, Prisoners of War Masonic Club. Uh, some uh, uh, some brothers have been uh, captured uh, during the World War II, and um, there were some interesting stories to it. So. Uh, uh, of course, uh, all the emails have, will be sent out again to remind you the same day, early, a few hours earlier than uh, you cannot uh, miss the meeting. So, uh, having said that, uh, I will close the, today's lecture and I will thank you so much, Brother Bob and uh, uh, everyone. Cleo, Cleo uh, you want to take the floor? Please yeah. go ahead then. <laughs> Just as a reminder for those who came in late, um, the Masonic Roundtable will be interviewing me and I will keep you guys posted on um, the date. Okay. Thank you, Cleo. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Um, okay, we can just say bye. The, as usually we do, the room will be open uh, uh, till... Uh, Till everyone decides that uh, it is time to go uh, to bed or to to work, I guess somewhere, and uh, the official part is over. Uh, it continues recording. It continues uh, live, and uh, this part is not moderated. You can unmute un uh, yourself and speak if you want to chat, discuss whatever. Just keep it uh, beyond the jurisdictional issues, beyond politics and religion. That rule remains and we should be decent and uh, uh, keep the harmony of this group. Thank you. Thanks Anyone again, is, David, uh, and thank well. you very much, Bob. Very well done, thank you. Pleasure, thank you. Thank right, you. Well, I'm, I'm going to nip to the little boy's room, um, but I'll come back. Okay, right. okay, the room is open, we won't go. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you very much, David. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Flamin. Thank you for participating. Okay. Renan, uh, you received the letter uh, by email, Bob, right? Yes, David. I thank you very much. I did nothing, you know. No, it all should be noted, I think, and it is not bad that uh, these uh, these people are being helped. And you know what is more interesting? <laughs> that today I learned that the family that stays, uh, he's here. Ah, Tavashan, you're here. Let um, me introduce. Let me introduce Tavashan. Hi, this is the head of this young family who stays in my apartment. He's from South Africa. Uh, uh, Tawashan, the, this live is publicly broadcasted and uh, you are free to talk about what you want uh, or what you feel is right for you to disclose here. But Thank very you. interesting Thank things you. I've learned about you. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. We really appreciate everything you've done for... My family, myself, we feel very welcomed in your country and, and really with all the contacts you've helped us uh, repatriate all the South Africans from here back to home. Uh, I've got some good news that they all landed in safely and they've been designated to the quarantine zone. 
So with everybody and all your contacts that you had to leverage for our personal benefit, we really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, so, so heard much. about that. Well done, well done. Very good. Yeah, uh, the question is, yeah, go ahead. May I say something, David? And hello, brothers. My name is Frank Kiefer. I'm here in the wilds of Palm City, Florida. And I really want to express my appreciation to, to you, David, and what you've done in putting these forums together. And of course, brother uh, Robert Cooper, they've been really helpful to me and very edifying. Thank you from my heart. Oh, it makes all well, okay, Thank you for, yeah. Oh, thank Hello, you. Bro. Hello, Renan, how are you? Brian, and you? Fine, yes, not too bad. Getting older and fatter by the day. <laughs> I'm going to send an email to you. Will you please check your mails? I'll try. The problem is there's so many, so many, so many routes to contact people now. So I've got WhatsApp, Messenger, Facebook, <laughs> Zoom. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, oh, and. and people have started filling in the, the online form on the website. So I'm getting messages. So there's five different ways. So I'm sometimes I'm struggling to keep up with everything. But that's why I'm getting older and fatter. Because I'm just oh, you are getting younger. Yeah, that's right. Just sitting here eating and typing all the time, you know. <laughs> it takes it takes time. <laughs> uh, indeed. Still, there we go. It's really yeah, beautiful rent, to see a forum sense. like this um, put together. Um, I'm also part of the FM or the, the GL from uh, Cape Town, Western Cape, the West Coast. Oh, yeah. With brothers yeah. Ron Sebi, our grandmaster. So it's really nice to see a, a following across the span of the globe being put together like this. I'm yeah. stuck in Georgia at the moment, but it's a beautiful experience <laughs> uh, uh -huh. under the care of David. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I learned this. about this just a few, few hours ago yeah, wow. <laughs> when we started the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's something else. I didn't <laughs> know. I just wrote the introductory note to the ambassador of South Africa in Georgia and to <laughs> Grand Secretary in South Africa. And cool. uh, just to, because there were some technical issues we've been discussing with them. <laughs> Tao Shan came wow. up with some wow. interesting comments. <laughs> yeah. That's good. It's good. It's all good stuff. You yeah. are all very small. Very small. Right? You sent it, Renan. No, 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 no. You have seen something. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask what, what lodge in, in Cape Town are you a member of? Uh, the West Coast Lodge with Brother Ron Selly as the Grand Master. Uh, is that Grand Lodge of South Africa? Uh, yes, the Grand Lodge of Cape Town, South Africa. Cape Town. It belongs, it's affiliated to South Africa. But right, we're just yeah. a small demographic within the Western Cape, the region uh -huh. of the Western Cape. Yeah, the reason, uh, reason I ask, I was, I was there in October last year for oh, wow. a, a, a three-week a three week lecture tour. <laughs> so they had wow. me talking nearly every night. So I was glad to get home. But uh, I went to Cape Town. And uh, give give a radio interview on Talk Radio seven o two. I think I actually um, remember that, and I remember your your voice and your name from there as well. Yeah. I, I do. Uh, it's very, very interesting country. Very interesting. Nice people. Nice people. Thank you. Yeah, brethren, um, could I uh, just uh, um, open a teeny dialogue about something that Aubrey mentioned? Um, which was the, I think, the difficulty placed on candidates before they can um, uh, move from one degree to another degree. Um, now, did you say that that was something which was peculiar to you in Chile, or is this a, a, a general problem? And the reason I ask it is because I'll, I'll probably reflect on the differences I've noticed um, in visit to American lodges in California and uh, our practices here in England? Well, I, I, I can't answer for whether it's peculiar for here in Chile or not. 
all I know is that uh, the Grand Lodge of Chile use that system. And, uh, and you think it's an oppressive system to candidates, which accounts for a lot of fall off? I, I, I personally believe that's the case. Um, and um, I, I've got a bit of a, uh, what's the best way? I have a strange feeling that it, 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 it's developed over the years and designed over the years to, to, to keep the old members in power and the, uh, the, the youngers down. Which is a great shame. Can I it, is, it is a great shame. I can't say if it's, if it's general throughout the ancient accepted Scottish right, but it's certainly the case here in Chile. Okay, so can I give, give you a little bit of context of, of what a progressive uh, uh, Mason might expect here in, in, in England? Um, and it's actually a very, very low bar. Um, uh, mm -hmm. A candidate who is initiated before his pass to the second degree, he'll be given a short series of questions and answers. Uh, the Nine, nine or ten questions and answers, and he'll be expected to learn the answers, you know, by by heart. Exactly uh, the same as us in Grand Lodge of Scotland. So it's not a particularly high bar here in the UK. Um, uh, it's uh, the 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 diligence of candidates is very very uh, uh, mixed. Some. In some lodges, you know, they will answer perfectly and others, they need one hell of a lot of prompting. Um, in the States, I've visited lodges where I noticed that before a candidate moves to the next degree, he has to go through a, 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 a catechism uh, a session and be quite proficient in uh, a, a huge number of questions and answers uh, and the ability to recite his obligation. And that's a much higher bar than we expect here in the UK. We still have fallout from uh, candidates who perhaps find that Freemasonry is not as interesting to them, uh, that they want to persist in it, but um, the ability to pass to a higher, to the next degree is not a, is not a bar here. Anyway, I thought I would share that with you. It um, gives us a chance to see how today's Freemasonry is practiced in, in our various countries. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting to see the London Fire Brigade fire engine behind you. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you want me to expand a little bit about that? Okay. You so, by uh, all means, do so. Then I, I'll make a comment as well. Okay. So, um, this, of course, comes down to fundraising, you know, and how do we go about fundraising? Um, in England, fundraising is almost entirely out of our own pockets. Um, Freemasonry does not uh, go into the wider world. It doesn't uh, uh, go to events, have tins, badges, flags, you know, whatever. But because we do have a large number of members uh, in London, uh, we have 1,250 lodges, membership is about 30,000. Yeah, and that gives us the that gives us the ability to raise something like um, one million pounds per year from our own resources. So in London, our Grand Master, well, the, the, the provincial Grand Master um, uh, has set a number of iconic charities that London Masons, you know, will, will subscribe to. The latest one, and this is, is, is part of it coming into fruition, was born out of the um, Grenfell fire the Grenfell Tower I a couple of years ago when uh, uh, I, th I think, of course, it was worldwide news, but almost 100 people died when, when a high-rise building, because of its cladding, um, was engulfed in flames. In London, we didn't have a very, very high-rise aerial platform to 
uh, to tackle that kind of fire. And in fact, we had to wait for these things to come in from other parts of the country. But the London Freemasons uh, set out just over two years ago to uh, donate, uh, raise two and a half million pounds and therefore to provide uh, two appliances like the one that you see in, in, in the picture. Um, and this was actually delivered uh, in March and came into service in March this year. Um, it's got the highest reach. I think it's almost 200 feet. It's got the highest reach of any appliance in Europe. And uh, it's a little bit shy of being uh, equal in the highest reach appliance in the world. And um, that was parked outside of Freemasons Hall on the day of London's uh, annual meeting in March. So it was a, a nice little image to uh, capture. That's the background there, Aubrey, so. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to make the, the comment here in, in Chile reg regarding um, fire brigades. They are all, all, um, supported by supported by public donations. There is a small amount of um, money which is comes from the government, but the majority is by public donations, and all the firemen are volunteers. And uh, the the uh, our particular lodge, Lodge Britannia, um, have made the point for two years of making considerable donation. When I say considerable, I'm talking about 500 pounds or thereabouts to one fire, fire brigade company and another 500 went to another fire brigade company. Um, why? Because we are, as Masons, a benevolent organization, not just between ourselves, but to the rest of the community. Bob, you waved your head. I'm wondering if that was an agreement or... Oh yeah, 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 very much so. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, I do have a, I do have a, a, a problem in, in, well, two, two, two comments, if you like. I do know that the London fire engine um, is coming for heavy criticism from trade unions um, in yeah. England, not not in Scotland, but trade unions in, in England, and including the Fire Brigade's own trade union, have uh, heavily criticised um, the London Fire Brigade for taking donations from a secret society. Um, mm. And uh, the, 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 the other problem that I have is that the fire engine um, in, in question um, has a very distinctive and very bold uh, image of the square and compasses thereon. So um, there's a considerable rethinking going on here about um, if you give something to charity, you're doing that um, out of the goodness of your heart without hope of reward. And that's the, our definition of charity. If we're giving um, money to charity and receiving something back, like um, having our logo uh, emblazoned on um, a fire engine or a helicopter or an ambulance, then we are actually um, getting something back for our donation. And it's no longer charity, it is sponsorship. And that's and the danger. Yeah, well, you, that's, that's what businesses do. They donate money in order to have their logo on the football ground or in um, a theatre programme or whatever, they get something back. Simple charity is giving money and getting nothing, nothing, not even recognition, getting nothing back whatsoever. And that's why I think we have got to be a bit more careful about, let's be or a bit more honest about what we're trying to achieve. If you're giving money to charity and uh, asking for people to thank you for doing so and making sure the press is there when the fire engine is handed over, making sure that the newspaper reporters are there 
when that event takes place, um, taking photographs of it, putting on social media, et cetera, et cetera. It's beginning to stretch um, the meaning of charity. And so mm -hmm. I, I, and that's in, in some ways, the media have cottoned on to that, um, saying, well, you know, anyone can give money to charity. Why do we need to report that you've done this? And I think that's, that's I, I don't think there's a, going to be an, an easy solution to it. But I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to think about the definition of charity in comparison to sponsorship. And this, the fact that we get yeah. something out of it is, is part of the problem. Yeah, Bob, everything you say is very valid. I'll let you go first, Norman. Okay. Everything you say is very valid. And and there was resistance. There was even resistance sort of in, in London Freemasonry. Um, uh, some of the lodges that, that, that I visit in, a, in an official capacity were coming back and saying, well, this is almost political because... Uh, you know, you, you are donating money where the government should be uh, supporting this, this kind of effort. So this was not without a certain amount, you know, of, of mm. controversy. Um, in terms of the logo and the visibility, um, this, is, th this was not something which was intended to be, well, what fantastic guys, you know, we are but merely to let the world and the community know that we are here and we are doing something for the community. Um, we don't want anything back. Uh, you know, we don't want anything tangible back, but is it so wrong to basically say, well, this was donated to the community by London Freemasons, you know, we are a force for good. Um, I I'm in favor of that. Yeah, let me let me just before Aubrey uh, Aubrey jumps in, the problem the problem that creates then is, um, and I've heard this across the uh, many from many places, that what you're doing is essentially you're um, going into competition with every other contributor to charity, who say exactly the same thing. We're here to support the community. We don't want recognition, but it's nice if we get it. So you're in direct competition with every other organization and indeed with businesses and indeed with local government, um, all who make contributions that are uh, supposedly charitable contributions. The, the, the problem I have with it is that we, by doing it this way, we are making ourselves the same as everybody else. We are no longer special we're doing exactly what every other contributor to charity are actually doing. And I think we should be finding a way of being different. We are just simply falling in the trap of, well, we're like a business or we're like, um, you know, whatever. And it doesn't, for me, it doesn't feel like we're being special anymore. I don't know, it's not terribly articulate, but that's... No, uh, Robert, that is... Uh completely valid and and re respected um i don't I, I don't share the same opinion because i believe that we should be we should be visible um more visible than than than, than we were in the in the past yeah. uh, and freemasons really have never really shouted much about the charitable works that sure. they but uh, anyway this, this is yeah. Yeah, I, I suppose ultimately the, 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 the next question would be, what, what, why do you need to be visible? What do you expect to get out of that increased visibility, whether it's in London or Chile? You see what I mean? So, uh, Well, um, is it a bad thing that thinking men and women in London, you know, might sort of you know think well you know this is a, a good organization to associate myself with um you so know we, we get to the crux of I mean, it you're, you're I, trying to you're trying to change perceptions um so you're, you're trying to get people to think nice thoughts about you um uh, let's well I, I think it's encouraging 
encourage <laughs> leadership, you know. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But, the, the but it is a but you you are you are now in a transaction situation where you you want something, whether you get it or not, is another matter. But you're 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 hoping that you're going to get something from that activity. And that's that's why I think you're now moving into the, the realms of maybe not pure uh, sponsorship, but you're no longer purely charitable either. You are doing something in the hope of reward, I, which is completely opposite. Can I come into my into the this subject? Help! Um, help! I have, I have two, something to say I've too. Two, I've got two guys. Um, against well, the, the, the first the first comment, of course, first comment I'm going to make is that um, we had uh, tremendous bushfires in Chile two years ago, and um, we made a donation to the central organization that was just a church sent into them. Um, and this year, or last, last year, we said, okay, now let's, we haven't got the bushfire problem this time, but the fire companies, individual fire companies in Chile, the majority of them, almost all of them, were set up by individuals. So there was the French fire company, there is the British fire company, uh, there is uh, various other fire companies, all set up individually. And I, as it happened, um, approached the British Fire Company to ask them if they would be prepared to accept a donation from us. Um, one of our other brothers, his father was actually a founder member of this fire company, which is in a very poor area of Chile, very poor area of Santiago. And he did the same. The, there was absolutely no publicity whatever. There was much thanks, many grateful thanks, a letter of acceptance, of course, because it's nice to have a letter of acceptance. At least it justifies where the funds went for the treasurer's point of view. But there was no intention whatsoever of publicity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I mean, I know exactly. I'm, I'm just being, a, I'm playing devil's advocate with Norman here. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I'm putting the Chilean points outside across. There isn't no in, advertising indeed, here. In, in, <laughs> indeed. I, of course, I'm a member of a London Lodge, um, past master of a London Lodge. So I, I, I get all, all the information and uh, it's uh, a magnificent, uh, a magnificent result. And how anyone, how anyone could criticize the fact that you now have a vehicle that potentially can save all those hundred or hundred lives should ever that disaster strike again. I, it's beyond me, it really is. It's, but you see, some people, I don't know what it is, some people just seem to have to have somebody to complain about, somebody to moan about, somebody who's at fault, you know? And I think we suit the bill, basically. We, we're, we're just a very handy whipping boy, sadly. Yeah. The Freemasonry in England, I, I think it's illustrative of the public attitude towards Freemasonry in England, especially now, that a trade union, I don't mean to make this political, but would call out Freemasonry for being non-transparent. I mean, anybody who's had any involvement in trade unions will know the first thing that goes out the window is any kind of transparency. There's nothing more clicky or inside baseball than a trade union. And for them to be pointing out the, the sliver in our eye when they've got to lift a lumber in their own by saying, oh, we're looking for public. Now, that being said, uh, had I been involved in the project, I would have recommended that we're not Rotarians. Let's not put our logo on the truck. But I can appreciate the feeling that this is an opportunity to raise the visibility of the craft. I myself 
don't think raising the, vi the visibility of the craft is a good idea. All that it does is raise questions of inclusion, transparency, and classism, which you can see in spades what's going on with the public's attitude towards the craft in England, which is much better now, but has been much worse in recent history. Uh, and I think this leads to a larger discussion of, you know, is this a few and secret organization that was co-opted by soldiers after World War II and just blown up to this gigantic organization and now is sort of right sizing to those of us who are interested in this rather radical idea of, you know, um, extreme liberal attitudes towards individual spiritual development. You go do what you want. We won't ask questions, you know, this sort of stuff. Um, the, the world, I think the world needs more Freemasonry, but I don't think Freemasonry is right for everybody. I mean, at one time in North America, one out of three of us were members of, a, of a men uh, were members of fraternal organization. And that's, that's not, it's like one in 50 now that maybe that's a more reasonable size for a society where individuals are doing their own thing all the time. It, largely Freemasonry kind of won that war and, you know, shouldn't we just let this right size itself and why we want to advertise? Why do we want to raise the profile? That's the real question here yeah. about this sort of thing. Sure. Um, I think part of it, you know, um, is particularly uh, on, on the part of people who attack us, for instance, trade unions um, are using us as a as a deflection uh, uh, tactic. Uh, don't look at what we're doing. Uh, the bad people are over there, you know, they're called Freemasons. Don't, don't look at us, look at them. And while, while you're looking at them, we can get on and do what the hell we like. Um, and I think it's got so bad here, and Norman will know of this outfit, it's called Unison, the trade union Unison, which I think is the biggest or the second biggest trade union in Britain. And I've, I've got this. Um, uh, 15 years ago at their annual conference, they passed a, a, a rule, a regulation, that henceforth anyone who applied to join that trade union had to state on their application form whether the applicant was or ever had been a Freemason. And they had to sign that declaration before they could be accepted into the trade union. And I've got I've got the, that application form. Two years later, they deleted that rule because they they realised that you know human rights and all the rest of it. But the point of doing that was not was simply not because they couldn't check. I, if I filled in saying I'm not a Freemason, they couldn't check to find out whether I'm not a Freemason. This was a very clever way of telling everybody who wanted to be a member of that union that you shouldn't be a Freemason as well. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, I, I think this is followed of us um, shying away from the modern argument. You know, if people ask us of Freemasonry's religion, Freemasonry fills every role of religion in a man's life in, in modern society. And this is a bigger question. But if we would just get over ourselves and identify ourselves as a religion, all of these questions in lots of places, especially in the progressive West, these questions would be out the window. The problem is where we're gaining a foothold in countries where they don't want secret religions to be operating, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, you know, it would solve problems for us in North America and England and Europe it would solve a lot of big problems if we would just fess up and be like, look, this is a deist organization where religion, please don't persecute us like those other religions. Uh, but then, then what do we do in, in other countries where membership yeah. is still secretive, very marginal, you know? So, uh, yeah, you have a representative here in uh, Georgia and Lithuania. We, uh, I'm, 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 it's so wonderful to listen to your experiences. But again, in Lithuania, it started, uh, I, I wouldn't go too, too far, 2012, uh, 2002. In Georgia, 2015. And... Uh, Whatever I'm doing now is so unusual around here. <laughs> doing the streaming uh, these lectures uh, online, it is extremely uh, kind of uh, going <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, in still, the cloud. still very secretive. It is. It is. I mean, uh, yeah. 
there is nothing we would have. Okay, I'm kind of being a brave guy here, sort of, but uh, yeah. that's because of my personal decision. But uh, in reality, reality is quite harsh. Uh, and uh, like uh, uh, they, I mean, the society wouldn't take you that easy. Uh, uh, as soon as you become an object of interest, of course, and uh, definitely what what I was thinking about this charity part, which uh, in our in in the case of Lithuania or in the case of Georgia, it is the brother the size of brother brotherhoods are very tiny in comparison to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands in UK in the United States in Canada, but. What would you think uh, in our cases? What, uh, how, I mean, uh, to one extent, you need to uh, kind of um, uh, give the sign of existence so the people understand that there is something that they can join, experience this personal, very individual journey that we are all engaged in. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you don't want to be kind of uh, not exposed, but not too public. Not, I mean, I'm, we cannot still uh, do too much charity because of the sizes and uh, the heavy burden of the charity. You cannot just go doing that. But what would you recommend in the case of Lithuania or in the case of Georgia? We are tiny countries in both cases, uh, nationwide and the brotherhoods worldwide. What would be your strategy to develop these institutions here in uh, these two countries? I mean. 300 something Lithuania, 100 something Georgia. This is the sizes we're talking about. Should we expose, should we yeah. go more public or not? Just stay there and wait like 100 years well, until someone you, learns about yeah, you, Essentially, David, you, 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 this is the realism. You're too small to be a danger right. or to be noticed by anyone. Um, Things may well change 10, 20 years time. And so perhaps yeah. this is the point in time where you, you're right, you start planning for when um, the organization is bigger. Uh, first thing I would do uh, from a financial point of view, so that you can actually make a statement when the time comes. I'm not saying that you'll be able to buy Norman's fire engine, um, not unless he gives <laughs> it away, but, um, yeah. but, but, you know, you op op open a bank account um, into which you pay a small amount of money on a regular basis and you can't touch it. And that's for future charitable use. Then at least you've, 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 um, you've embedded the idea of um, uh, gathering money for charitable purposes. It might not be of any great use at the moment, but once you start that ball rolling with the miracle of compound interest, eventually, you know, eventually you might have a goodly sum to, to, to spend um, on, on a charity. But unless you start saving now, you're not going to have any savings in 10 years time sort of thing. So, so you know, you've got to take the first step. And that's just simply, just simply a way of, of, of preparing, planning for the future. I think it's important to note, if, if I may, it's important to note that the, we were talking about agape earlier, and, and, and agape in modern Freemasonry is often expressed as charity, but it's, it, it's an antiquarian idea of charity. It isn't the giving of alms, which is a different thing, or a direct relief, which is a different thing. The idea of charity, Masonic charity, is is really the idea of forbearance, or to put it more simply in modern Absolutely. terms, tolerance. tolerance. And so you, you, we see that expressed in a religious sense where we, most lodges in most jurisdictions will accept any, any deist individual. So if you can claim that you believe in a supreme being, whatever supreme being that is, whether it's your higher self or it's uh, uh, Yahweh or it's whatever, that, that that is the idea of forbearance or tolerance is that you allow others without dogma to attach to your organization. They accept these few principles and then we decide, okay, we're not going to talk about hardcore politics or religion in here so that we can be men with other things in common and avoid all the modern tribalism. 
and have a, 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 a tolerant environment. Um, in, in some ways, the raising of large sums of money for almsgiving is a result of Freemasonry's success, but I don't think it's a cornerstone of Masonic attitude. I think it's important to note that the tolerance and bringing that tolerance to a visible uh, uh, manifestation, that's, that's the real reason Freemasonry exists and the real external message of much of the degrees is that yeah. you know your experience of life is your experience and everything else that that guy experiences is for his business but here's a way you can meet and discuss these mysteries of existence with this little bit of language and common experience that's what an initiation passing and raising is for yeah. whoa i took that in a totally different direction <laughs> indeed let me give you a quick example of 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 what I what I see or what I've seen as innovative charity by Freemasons. Um, you remember the tsunami that hit the uh, the, the uh, Malaysian islands, Indonesian islands, um, uh, because of the, the the nature of the political system in these countries. Donating money directly to government meant that you were lucky if twenty percent actually reached. Um, the, the people that needed the money. So what uh, some of the Grand Lodges in Australia did was they chartered a, a ship and they loaded it with uh, building materials and uh, put out a, an appeal for um, bricklayers, plumbers, glaziers, all the kind of people that could actually build things. And off they went and they rebuilt uh, fishing villages uh, that had been destroyed in the tsunami. And that way, nobody got their hands on any cash at all. The charity initiative was to actually do the work that the money was it would have been intended to do. And so, you know, for, for taking, taking your vacation and donating that time and your expertise as an electrician or a doctor or whatever, and going there um, had a much, much bigger impact uh, at a local level than just money would have had. Now, of course, that's that's a part of the world where that would work. I'm not suggesting that you actually do that in London. I don't think you could set up your own fire brigade in London sort of thing. But um, but you see the point. Um, that So uh, Freemasons are, are, are able to look at a situation and decide what charity means in that situation. Anyone can stick money in a box on a, uh, being shaken in front of your nose. That took, uh, in my opinion, that took Masonic charity in a completely different direction. And I just, I, I don't know whether it's ever been followed up, but I, I would hope that it was. But it's a, one hell of a commitment to expect people to separate um, over a few hundreds of miles away from family and friends. But I was, that impressed the hell out of me, I have to say. Yeah, that feeds into what Brother Honor Force was saying the other day about, about uh, Masonry being the first non-governmental organization, the first international NGO. And you can see in this example of getting these brethren, uh, the South African brethren home is another good example. You, 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 you pool your influence and you call in some favors and you can pull some strings and make things happen, um, which people who are on the outside uh, would accuse us of influence peddling, but once you're inside and you realize the obligations we've taken, the words we've said, if you take it seriously, if somebody were to call you and say, I, I need a favor and it might cost you something, you know, uh, I think that's fascinating. And to have uh, esteemed Brother Onofor say that the other day, uh, just kind of, I'd never thought of it that way, it kind of blew my mind actually. And yeah. hearing you, Brother Cooper, talking about that just now in Indonesia, that's just a, another good example of yeah. uh, people doing the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing. Sorry, Aubrey, I keep cutting you off. No problem. Can I make a, 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 a comment regarding uh, um, uh, Masonic charity in, in, in Chile? In, uh, I think it was 1985, we had a very large earthquake out here. And uh, the, uh, the Grand Lodge of Chile uh, put out an appeal for funds from people all over the place uh, and uh, 
I contacted the Grand Lodge of Scotland on the subject and the Grand Lodge of Scotland made a donation of, I think it was £5,000 to the Grand Lodge of Chile's fund for them to do their work, which they considered was necessary for the relief and the restoration in many cases of temples and, uh, and the likes. And uh, the, the Grand Lodge of Scotland made a direct donation to the Grand Lodge of Chile for that subject, mm -hmm. which good. was obviously very much appreciated. Yeah, I don't know if £5,000 is a lot of money, to be it's honest. A, it's not no. a lot of money, but no. No. Um, £5,000 is quite a lot in Chile. Yeah, you, well, you, could, you could employ a lot of men for a lot of time for five thousand pounds in those days. The, the, the other problem that we have here in the UK, certainly in comparison with England, um, and I, I, I'm we're now talking entirely personal opinion, hmm. but um, the Grand Lodge of Scotland will never ever be able to compete uh, financially with the Grand Lodge of England. That's just simply hmm. not possible. The population of Scotland is so small. And the, the membership uh, is, the demographic of the membership is essentially working class, um, 90, 95% working class. There is no big middle class in Scotland and there's very little in the upper, in terms of upper class. And I use these terms crudely and generally. And so um, that's another problem for us that um, the Grand Lodge of England create without realizing um, is that when they make these massive public donations, there is simply no way the Grand Lodge of Scotland can respond in any way, uh, in any kind of equal way. I mean, even if you, if the Grand Lodge of England, uh, and I think it's, it's a staggering some millions of pounds a year, um, you would normally expect Scotland to be able to uh, deliver 10% of any sort of equivalent it's just not going to happen so uh, the Scots are in are, are in a bind you know when we see the generosity of the English Freemasons that we can't possibly match and so yeah. that gives us a that's a gives us a big problem but yeah. that's uh, the way it is well I, I don't think we're competing to, to no no, you know, no, no. Yeah, for the <laughs> who's the biggest and, and best in, in in terms of giving no. of course um the, uh, the, the level that um, we're showing here is solely the London province. Um, mm -hmm. It's the Metropolitan Grand Lodge that, and you're a member of Lodge in London, so you're probably behind that uh, as well. But uh, as you'll know, um, each year, every lodge in, in, uh, under United Grand Lodge of England, uh, almost 7,000 lodges, England, Wales districts abroad, um, are making a donation uh, as well as uh, Grand Lodge dues also uh, to the Grand Lodge charity. And this is where some quite big money is being, being amassed. That, of course, is not within the purvey of London or, or the Metropolitan. Mm. Lodge. It's it's the United Grand Lodge of England, and um, uh, you know, I think they they do some pretty pretty good stuff. Um, some of the things they do, which are very silent, and I think I've mentioned before when I've I've had the floor, um, are making grants available to, for medical research, very discreet medical research, and those who are involved in the in the research actually come into the quarterly communications and uh, uh, address the Grand Lodge uh, uh, with the, what they're achieving, achieving to date. Well, there's not much sponsorship involved there at all, but it is producing you know, good things. We can be proud of that, but masonry has got to develop into the century um, and the use of uh, um, social media uh, is, is being used at an ever increasing scale to increase visibility and, and also membership efforts. Um, and I do know a little bit about that side of things for the things that I, I do in London. Uh, Robert, Bob, can I inquire which lodge, which London lodge you're a member of? 
I'm just part of Coronati. Oh, you are quite a Coronati. Yeah, yeah. Past master there. I uh, can't remember which year, but uh, yeah, I've been a member now for 20 years. Let me pose you a question. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this question. Um, and this is, this is a UK question, really. Um, given all the, all the nonsense we get from the likes of trade unions and, and some political parties and indeed religious leaders, what do you think the reaction would be if all of a sudden the Grand Lodge of England, specifically the Grand Lodge of England, said, from next Monday, we are giving nothing to any charity anywhere for a full 12 months. What do you think that kind of um, statement, would? what kind of reaction would that get? Well, um, pretty- I, tell you, I, tell, I can tell you, yes. there would be shock because everybody takes the Grand Lodge of England's charitable donations for granted. And that would be one way of reminding people that this is charity. Sorry, end of short rant. <laughs> <laughs> very reasonable it would, comment. Very sensible and reasonable comment. It would be shocking. And it's it's the same here in North America. There is hundreds of millions of dollars being donated by uh, every Masonic level down with the Blue Lodges supporting a local women's shelter like we do here, uh, all the way up to what the Shrine Hospitals do at their six hospitals across the states. And some of the, I think it's, the, I think that number is in the hundreds of millions. And of course, they're, they're raising that with active fundraising, but it still is, it still counts as, as relief from, from the Masonic fraternity, but you, it, attempting to tote that up and present the public with a bill would only be seen as skeptical. And so, unfortunately, we can't do. We all we do is we. That no good deed goes unpunished, as uh, Mark Twain might have said. Yeah, yeah. I just think it would be it would be interesting. I mean, if if you picked one of the major charities, and you said, look. Um, and I'm not saying that you would ever actually do this, but if you said to them, look, we give you a million pounds every year and you do nothing to defend us in public. If you don't start defending us in the, in the media, you're not getting the million quid. Now, they wouldn't like it, but they would sit up and take notice. I'm not saying you would pick on a charity, but that's, if you, if you, if you, if you simply said, nobody, no charity is getting any money from us for 12 months. That, you, that would get you more headlines than you've had in the last 20 years. <laughs> and that's, and that, and sadly, that is a reflection of the society in which we live. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah, give, give to charity, we'll take it. Thank you very much. Don't ask us to do anything for it. Anyway, guys, I must go to the little boys room. And as I say, end of rant. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank to you, brother, brother Cooper, for being so generous with your time. Oh my god! Yes, definitely, definitely. After lecture parties are very interesting, always. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. So, uh, David, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure, sure, please. Um. How do did Lithuania and Georgia, two extremes of what used to be the uh, the, the Soviet Union, Soviet Union, join together? Uh, state uh, when did they join together? I mean, join together for this this um, um, this group lectures. Yeah, uh, I will finish one extreme of the to the other. Uh, can I finish the recording uh, to keep yes. under the rule? Yes, yes. So just one second, then I'll uh, say goodbye to everyone. So thank you, and let me stop recording, and let me.